Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 35th meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I please ask you all to make sure your mobile phones are on silent? Agenda item one, which is what we're dealing with, is the Forestry and Land Management Scotland Bill. Today, we are undertaking stage two consideration of that bill, and I'd like to welcome Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity, and his officials from the Scottish Government. Everyone should have with them a copy of the bill as introduced, the Marshall List of Amendments that were published on Thursday, and the groupings of the amendments which sets out the amendments in the order in which they will be debated. Before we go on, I should point out that the clerks have advised me that Amendment 136 appears in the wrong place on the marshalled list and should be, in fact, after Amendment 114. We will take it at that place in the proceedings, and the changings will not affect the groupings. It may be helpful at the outset to explain the procedure briefly. There will be one debate on each group of amendments. I will call the member who lodged the first amendment in that group to speak to and move that amendment, and to speak to all other amendments in that group. I will then call any other members who have lodged amendments in that group. Members who have not lodged amendments in the group but who wish to speak should indicate that they want to do so by catching my attention in the usual way. If he has not already spoken in the group, I will invite the Cabinet Secretary to contribute to the debate just before I move to the winding up speech. The debate on the group will be concluded by me inviting the member who moved the amendment in the group to wind up. Following the debate on each group, I will check whether the member who moved the First Amendment in that group wishes to press it to a vote or to withdraw it. If they wish to press ahead, I will put the question on the amendment. If the member wishes to withdraw their amendment after it has been moved, they must seek the agreement of the other members of the committee to do so. If any member present objects, the committee immediately moves to vote on the amendment. If any member does not want to move their amendment when, they, when called, they should say, not moved. Please note that any other member present may move such an amendment. If no one moves the amendment, I will immediately call the next amendment on the marshalled list. Only committee members are allowed to vote. Voting in any decision is by a show of hands, and it is important, please, that members keep their hands up clearly raised until the clerks have recorded the vote. The committee is required to indicate formally that it has considered and agreed each section and schedule of the bill, so I will put a question on each section at the appropriate point. Now we aim to complete stage two today, but let us see how we get on. So I'm now going to move to the first question, and that is the question, the first question is that section one be agreed. Are we all agreed? I'm going to put that again. The question is that section one be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. I therefore move on to the next section, which is the purpose of the bill, and I call amendment 14 in the name of Rhoda Grant in a group on its own. Rhoda Grant is pleased to move and speak to member, amendment 14. Rhoda. Can I move and speak to Amendment 14? Um, this is a purpose clause for the Act. The amendment is to add clarity to the purpose of the Act. We all know the Act came about because of devolution of the Forestry Commission, and that's welcome. However, we must have ambition for forestry, uh, more ambition for forestry than just that. Um, this amendment shows that ambition, that ambition and what our focus should be. To promote sustainable management of forestry and the and promote the social, economic and environmental impacts of forestry. This states very clearly at the beginning of the Act the purpose of the Act and the benefits that forestry can bring. OK, thank you. Uh, I now call uh, Jamie Green, you indicated. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Convener. Um, I think uh, the only comments we have to make on this is that, in principle, we agree with uh, Rhoda Grant's suggestion that there should be an overarching... Um, uh, purpose to the Act. Uh, the problem we have is that this specific wording uh, of this is um, 
unable, unable to support the, the, those specific words. We feel it doesn't, uh, isn't all-encompassing enough. It's too prescriptive in the definition of the purpose of the Act. Uh, so we would like to see uh, a purpose uh, to the Act, um, but we will, uh, well, I certainly will be voting against the specific wording. However, we would like the Cabinet Secretary to take on board the view that um, it could a purpose of Act be introduced with perhaps some wider wording. Okay, John. Yes, well, I think very much on the same lines, same lines as Jamie Green. Uh, I think a pur purpose clause for an act is an extremely good thing. This whole parliament is set up with uh, the, sta the statement that there will be a Scottish parliament. I think it clarifies things. I think it helps the courts look at the spirit of the, the law rather than just the letter of the law. Uh, but again, uh, like Jamie Green, I have reservations about the wording of this particular purpose clause. Okay, Stuart. Uh, I'll ask my lack. If we put this in, it is the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. Uh, the effect of uh, this is actually to restrict the scope of the Act rather than to uh, extend it, because by putting a purpose in, uh, the whole Act is defined by that purpose and nothing which is not defined in that. So therefore, I'm afraid, notwithstanding the sympathies with the underlying uh, 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 approach that Rod is taking, I can't support this. Okay, John Finney. Yeah, I do support Rhoda on this. I think that uh, everything's open to interpretation. I think there is clarity about what has been said there, and I think it is a, a worthwhile addition to the legislation in front of us. Okay, thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, before I ask Red to wind up, could, are there any comments you'd like to make on this? Yes, uh, and uh, good morning, convener, and to members. And perhaps I could just say at the outset that uh, I thank uh, all members. Uh, of all parties uh, for the constructive meetings that I had prior to, to stage two. I, I, my officials found them useful. I hope that uh, members did as well. Uh, and I wanted to make it clear that uh, between stages two and three, I would follow the same process and offer a further series of meetings with members with the aim of working together uh, to try to ensure that the legislation is in the best uh, possible state. Um, today, I will offer at various points to take away important issues that have been raised by various members with an undertaking to work with members to take away and improve and come back at stage three with various matters. And I just wanted to emphasise that as my approach convener at the beginning. Turning to Rhoda Grant's uh, amendments, I, I share the ambitions for the forestry sector in Scotland. Um, this government has an unequivocal commitment to forestry, uh, and I hope and believe that that is not in doubt. We have introduced the first primary legislation on forestry since the Parliament was reconvened in 1999. The Bill has a purpose. Uh, it is the main legislative vehicle to complete devolution of forestry and establish modern arrangements for this key land use in Scottish legislation, a long-standing Scottish Government manifesto and programme uh, uh, for government commitment. Um, therefore, the purpose goes beyond sustainable forestry management. It's about devolution as well. Uh, and that's not stated in the, uh, in the amendment. The bill provides a modern legislative framework for regulation, support, development and management of forestry in Scotland. It also embeds sustainable forest management across that framework, introducing a duty on Scottish ministers to promote sustainable uh, forestry management in section two of the bill and to publish a forestry strategy with sustainable forestry management at its core. Um, the internationally agreed definition of sustainable forestry management is, and I quote, the stewardship and use of forests and forest lands in a way and at a rate that maintains their biodiversity, productivity, regeneration capacity and vitality, and the potential to fulfill now and in the future relevant ecological, economic and social functions at local, national and global levels, and does not cause damage to other ecosystems. Given the importance of this phrase, I thought it useful to put on the record that definition at the early stages of stage two. So this is about good management of forestry for long term and for multiple benefits at all levels. And that's why it is already at heart of the forestry functions in the bill. I, I would also question the use of the word impact in the amendment. Um, I don't support the amendment, but were I to do so, I think perhaps positive impact or benefit might have been better alternatives to the word impact, which does have a negative or potentially negative connotation convener. So, whilst I share and indeed applaud the sentiment that both Rhoda Grant and John Finney have expressed support for, uh, I would respectfully suggest that this amendment is 
is uh, technically flawed. It uh, doesn't really achieve the, the aims that it sets out to achieve, and it risks, as Mr Stevenson says, uh, causing difficulties. And for those reasons, I would encourage members to resist Amendment 14. Thank you. Uh, Rhoda, would you like to wind up and press or withdraw the amendment, please? I think the, the, having a purpose clause in the Act is really important because an awful lot of the amendments that come after this one is because there is no purpose clause in the Act and it's trying to frame the Act in a way that people can understand and um, go forward with. So I, I firmly believe the Act requires a purpose clause. I've heard what other members have said about maybe some of the wording. Um, so I won't press the amendment at this moment in time. I'll take it away and maybe speak to other parties and other members to try and find um, wording that would help. And I understand from the Cabinet Secretary that he is not keen on a purpose clause full stop, so I don't expect um, to work with him on that, but I would certainly appreciate input if there was if there were concerns about that. So I would bring a new amendment um, and share it with the Cabinet Secretary in the hope of getting that right, especially at stage three. Sorry, can I just confirm there for Radar, are you pressing or withdrawing the amendment? I'm withdrawing. You're withdrawing the amendment. So does any other member present object to the amendment being withdrawn? Okay. If, we will then move on to the next amendment, uh, and on this the grouping is the Sustainable Forest Management and Code of Practice, and I'd like to call Amendment 118 in the name of Gail Ross, grouped with Amendment 119. Gail Ross, please could you move Amendment 118 and sp <coughs> speak to both amendments in the group, please? I will move uh, Amendment 118 and speak to both. Uh, this amendment proposes the inclusion in the Bill of a duty to develop a statutory method of assessing and monitoring sustainable forest management. This would mean adopting best practice forestry guidelines, which are currently outlined by the UK Forestry Standard, into legislative requirements. Currently, the UK Forestry Standard, while wide-reaching and a good representation of best practice, is not embedded in legislation. And by adopting a code of practice, it would ensure that future afforestation is transparent, that its environmental benefits are clear and in the public interest, and would protect against any risk of changing policy environments that may not place sustainability in such high regard. I am open to any discussion on this, including whether the bill or the forestry strategy is the correct place for it. Okay. Um, Jamie Green, you indicated you wanted to speak. Thank you. Uh, convener, I think there's some um, admirable intent with Gail Ross's uh, amendment here. I think there's a, 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 um, uh, certainly a shared opinion that Section uh, 2 of the Bill as it stands is quite light uh, on um, going into more detail on, on what duties are on, on ministers to promote sustainable forest management. Uh, my only problem with this specific amendment, uh, specifically 119, is it's very prescriptive in its nature and, and in terms of who the minister must consult, SNH and other parties. So I think there is some room for uh, um, uh, expanding the scope of what, um, uh, of, of what the, the minister must, must do, but uh, I do feel that this is probably too detailed in that sense for primary legislation. Okay, Rhoda, you asked to speak. Just um, on clarification, point of clarification, um, when Gail Ross was speaking, she said it was to enshrine the UK forestry standard in the Act. My reading of it appears that it replaces that. I'm just looking for some clarification. It's, it's adopting the code of practice that is currently under the UK forestry standard. So could I, could I just ask if, if there's a specific question, if you could deal with that in the winding up uh, section oh, of it, uh, uh, if I may. Are there any, does anyone else want to speak uh, at that stage? Okay, so Cabinet Secretary, would you like to, to enter into this? Yes, thank you, Convener. I do appreciate the efforts made by Gail Ross with this amendment to address concerns raised during Stage 1 about the definition and technical aspects of sustainable forest management. During the committee discussions, there was broad acceptance from stakeholders that the current UK forest standard is a good guide to sustainable forestry practice, providing practical guidance on sustainable forest management in Scotland. 
However, the detailed interpretation of what constitutes sustainable forest management is continually developing, and I don't believe that it's appropriate to commit any specific standard on the face of this bill. I therefore accepted the committee's recommendation that the Scottish Government should lay out its approach in the Scottish Forest Strategy, as well as setting out how it will integrate with the UK forest standard. Given that I have accepted the need to lay out both the definition of sustainable forest management and the means by which we will integrate with the UK forest standard and the strategy, um, convener, I don't believe these amendments are required, and therefore I, I would respectfully ask Gail Ross not to press this amendment, but offer to meet with her so that I can better un understand the intent behind it and explore options to address her concerns. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Gail Ross, could I ask you to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 118? Um, yes, I thank both uh, Jamie Green and Rhoda Grant and the Cabinet Secretary for their input. And, uh, it was an amendment for um, probing, and after the Cabinet Secretary's comments, I will accept um, his recommendation and I will withdraw the amendment. Okay. Thank you. Therefore, as far as Amendment 118 is concerned, does any other member present object to the amendment being withdrawn? Okay, so therefore it's withdrawn. And uh, moving now to Amendment... Okay. Sorry. I'm still getting the hang of this, so I apologise. Uh, as that is the end of a section, I have to ask if that section is agreed, and are we all agreed? Agreed. Okay. So I'm now calling Amendment 119 in the name of Gail Ross, which has already been debated with Amendment 118. Gail Ross, do you wish to move or not move the amendment? Not move. Okay. Does any other member present object to the amendment being withdrawn? No. Thank you. So, therefore, we now move on to the... Let's say, I should have said the question is that Amendment... Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I think I was right there. It's not often that I'm right and the clerks are wrong. <laughs> but occasionally when I am, I'm going to luxuriate in it. <laughs> so I'm going to move on to the second grouping, which is forestry strategy and content. And I'm going to call Amendment 120 in the name of Ray Grant, group with the amendments 1, 7, 8, 116 and 117. Ray de Grant, could you please move Amendment 120? speak to all the amendments within the group. Um, can I move Amendment 20, 120 and speak to the other amendments in the group? Um, this section refers to the strategy and um, that it must include Scottish Government objectives, priorities and policies with respect to certain things. My amendment adds to the section regarding the the economic development of forestry, in particular of communities dependent on forestry. It's clear that many of our communities are dependent on, economic development, on the economic development generated by forestry. Their need must be taken into account when developing the economic development of forestry. For too long, communities have had little engagement with forestry, and historically, much of, of, of the forestry has been planted as tax breaks rather than for, the economic, for economic and environmental good. Ideal forest land is close to our most fragile communities, and while promoting forestry, we have an excellent opportunity to grow and strengthen these communities. Turning to the other amendments in the group, I listen with interest to the debates surrounding them, but I do have some concerns. Amendment 1 might constrain Scottish ministers when acquiring or disposing of land. If this were not in the strategy, could it be challenged? The only time I would see a challenge coming forward, however, would be when it was subject to compulsory purchase, which could put a further barrier in the way of compulsory purchase. I agree with the other amendments in the group, especially Amendment 8. I would really like to see more native woodland, not just aesthetically, but I would also like to see us manage and use native timber and native trees. Okay, thank you. And now I'd like to call Mike Rumbles to speak to Amendment 1 and all the other amendments in the group. And can I just f first put on record my view that this is a very good bill. Uh, I think it will be really helpful to forestry in Scotland. And because it was such a good bill, I was rather surprised that we were dealing with something like 140 amendments. It took me by surprise. So I've only put, so I've contributed three of those today, and I'm speaking just to one of them, which is Amendment Number 1, because the other two and three are other 
consequentials. So this is the only issue that I have put forward. And I've tried to put it forward in a constructive uh, way to add importance to the bill and to make sure that the bill is more comprehensive than it would have otherwise been. And I hope the minister will, uh, and, and, and colleagues on the committee will, will um, accept it. Because what I'm trying to do very basically is, if you look at um, subsection three, the forestry strategy must include the minister's objectives, priorities and policies with respect to economic development of forestry, the conservation and enhancement of the environment by means of sustainable forest management, and the realization of the social benefits of forestry. All very good. All I'm seeking to do is add one further in there in t to say to the, to the minister that when he produces the forest strategy, it should also include the acquisition and disposal of land under sections 15 to 17. It's entirely in the hands of the minister and the strategy in that case. I don't think it's restrictive. I think it's, it, it enhances the bill. It makes it absolutely clear what we're trying to achieve. And I hope that members will, will accept amendment number one. If I could just say... Um, amendment number eight, um, I'd like to say that um, I understand John Finney's wishes about this, but I actually think that, uh, speaking to the industry, I know that the industry feel that putting a percentage on it um, is overly restrictive, um, and certainly that's the view that has been put to me, and I, and I accept that, so I'm not inclined to support John's at number eight, and I, I particularly like uh, Richard uh, Lyle's 116 and 117. Okay. Can I call on Peter Chapman to speak to Amendment 7 and any other amendments in the group? Uh, thank you, Convener. I will move Amendment 7 in my name. Uh, I, I think there's a, there's a real uh, omission in the bill in that the, there are no targets in the bill as to where, how much planting we would like to see going forward. I think it, I'm very keen to see more planting in Scotland, as the uh, Cabinet Secretary is well aware, I think. Uh, but we need to have targets in the bill, I believe, and we need to be able to scrutinise them. Um, so I, I, this really is a, about putting targets, planting targets in there, and uh, uh, gives us an opportunity to see how we are progressing as regards meeting these targets. As far as the other uh, uh, amendments, I, 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 I've struggled to understand what Rhoda Grant is trying to say in her amendment 120, she speaks about dependent communities dependent on forestry. There's, there's no indica indication of how dependency is going to be measured. And, you know, I, I, there's just a, a lack of meaning in there. Um, I'm supportive of uh, Mike Rumble's amendment. I am against John Finney's one in that a percentage is the wrong way forward. Um, I think we actually need to see more uh, productive uh, trees uh, planted the ones that will, will actually uh, support the, the, the forestry industry and the sawmills. Um, so uh, we, we will probably see more native woodland planted as, as the planting uh, area increases. But the percentage is the wrong way around uh, because that obviously will mean less of the productive timber that we, we need. I am supportive of Richard Lyle's, uh, both Richard Lyle's amendment. Thank you, uh, Peter. Can I just remind members, you don't have to move your amendment uh, when you're speaking at this stage. Uh, when we come to your amendment and voting on it, I will ask you to move it at that stage. So, John Finney, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 8 and any other amendments you want to? Uh, thank you, Convener. Yeah, uh, this is about increasing the percentage of a native woodland. And uh, the predominant species in Scotland is the Sitka spruce, and that's a non-native species and um, covers a third of our total forest area. And... I'm advised that reliance on a non-native species is unusual in, in a European context, and uh, here native woodland accounts for under a quarter of the total woodland and less than a, a fifth of the national forest estate. Um, and uh, it, it has a role to play in, in, uh, in forest production. Indeed, hardwoods are used. Um, um, I think of Norboard near Inverness, a, a, a big factory people will be aware of, which imports hardwoods from the Baltic states. Um, and it can deliver much more in terms of the ecosystems, recreation, well-being, flood, flood prevention, education, increased soil, air quality, so on, and greater di di biodiversity. 
And indeed, that biodiversity is recognised in the Scottish di biodiversity strategy. Uh, and so it's a target to improve the condition and extent um, that around us. And that's not being met at the moment. And there's an independent assessment of native woodland that indeed says it's moving in the wrong direction. So the, the Scottish Government can send a very clear signal here about their ambitions for native woodland by accepting this amendment to increase the percentage of forest land that is in native woodland. And to be clear, that, um, that this would apply to all forest land, uh, be it publicly owned or in private ownership, but in receipt of public grants. And the, the Cabinet Secretary is entirely right to say that there were very constructive discussions uh, um, in advance of, of this meeting. And uh, to say that Scottish Environment Link believe that half the woodland should be native, um, I, I didn't go ahead with that, but I did say, uh, talk about an increase. And I'm very happy to uh, be engaged in ongoing discussions with the the Cabinet Secretary on this, but it would be helpful to, to hear the general direction of travel that the Scottish Government see with this matter. Th thank I'm you. sorry, and, and with regard to that, I want to beg your pardon. Uh, supportive of RODAS, and I think, uh, again, as previously out outlined, um, the great significance in some, for some communities uh, that, that there are. Um, relaxed about Mr Rumble's, um, uh, um, Mr Chapman's, um, and will be supporting Richard Royals. Thank you. Okay. Um, Rich Lowe, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 160 <coughs> and yeah. any other members, uh, amendments in the group? Yes. Uh, thank you, Convener, for offering me a chance to speak to these amendments put forward my name. Legislation we're considering will, amongst other things, repeal the Forestry Act 1967. This Act gives Ministers responsibility for a general duty of promoting the interests of forestry, development of afforestation, the production and supply of timber and other forest products. A number of organisations consulting the bill thought these duties should be carried forward into a new bill we are considering today. However, after consideration, this committee came to the view that the proposed forestry strategy should take account of the need to expand forest and woodland cover in Scotland, ensure sufficient production of timber for Scotland's needs in the future. My amendments will therefore ensure that this bill is amended to reflect recommendation 52 from our stage one report. More importantly, perhaps the amendments will ensure that Scotland retains a clear and unambiguous commitment to afforestation. Forest cover in Scotland is currently 18%, compared to EU average of 38%. France, Spain, Germany, Italy all have over 30% forest cover, while Scandinavian countries like Finland and Sweden are way above at 65% or greater. Last month, I actually held a, I hosted a lunch for Pakistani MPs, um, and they told me that they had planted over a billion trees, a billion trees in their region, not in the country, in their region. We therefore must do better. The committee has recognised that the Scottish Government has an ambitious forestry policy that has supported widely across industry and by non-government organisations. However, times change and this might not always be the case. If Scotland had a level of forest cover in line with uh, European norms, then dropping our existing legal requirement for us afforestation might be justified. However, at a time when this, we as a nation are seeking to expand our forests and woodlands to lock up carbon, support a vital low-carbon industry, dropping the requirement for afforestation and ensuring supply of timber and forest products will send out the wrong signals. I therefore urge my committee members to support my amendments put forward in my name. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lyle. Um, Stuart, do you want to say something? Um, yes, let me unusually um, encourage Mike Rumbles to speak to uh, at least his amendment two in Group 6. Otherwise, we'll not get started on Group 6 because he's got the lead there. Uh, I think his amendment is a, a sensible one that uh, uh, adds clarity. Uh, the other amendments, I, I've no great problems with the underlying uh, intention, uh, but have some difficulties with the construction. And like Peter Chapman, I think communities dependent on forestry in her amendment, well, I would argue all communities in Scotland are dependent on forestry in the sense that we have timber frame houses, we have furniture, we look around the parliament here, we sit uh, behind a wooden table. Um, so, so, so I think it, it's not clear that that adds anything. Um, where uh, Richard Lyle's amendments are concerned, I have my usual hesitation at extending lists um, that, that make me reluctant. And in particular, 117, production, supply of timber and other forest products. I think really that is already covered by the economic development of forestry. But 
you know, it's, it's debatable. Um, and uh, I, I think I, I share others' reservations about uh, uh, John Finney's amendment. While I would wish the practical effect of the bill uh, to be uh, the increase in the amount of native woodland in appropriate locations where it will flourish. Thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, uh, it, the floor is now yours, is it not? Uh, thank you, Convener, and thank you, Members, for an interesting discussion thus far. Um, and I'm grateful to Mike Rumbles, Peter Chapman, John Finney, Richard Lyle, and Rhoda Grant for lodging these amendments. And uh, I'm content to support uh, the majority of them in principle, uh, but further work is required in some cases. I signaled to the committee during stage one that I recognise the need to be more explicit and to provide clarity on the potential content of the, of the Scottish forestry strategy. And I believe the intent behind most of these amendments is, is to achieve the same aim. Let me be clear that uh, I am, um, convener, committed to increasing the benefits that forestry provides to Scotland, whether that is improving our environment, our economy, or the lives of our people. <coughs> To achieve that, we must have balance in what we do, employing the best silvicultural practices and engaging with stakeholders to ensure that we have the right tree, whether that be a broadleaf or a conifer, in the right place for the right reasons. And I think it's fair to reflect that uh, in, the, in some cases in the past, that did not happen. Uh, as you have heard me say before, Forestry has unique potential for delivering a multitude of environmental, social and economic benefits from one piece of land, and it's important that our strategy recognises and helps to realise that potential. Part of my commitment to increasing the contribution that forestry makes to our rural economy is to secure vibrant rural communities, which, to which Rhoda Grant refers in Amendment 120. However, I feel the purpose behind that amendment is already clearly articulated, convener, in the principles of the land use strategy and the provisions of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015, which provide people with opportunities to engage and influence decisions which affect their lives and their future. I therefore would respectfully ask Rhoda Grant not to press this amendment. Moving on to Amendment 1, I have committed to sustaining the National Forest Estate as a public asset and intend that the overarching principles for disposals should appear in the forestry strategy. I am therefore happy to support Mike Rumble's amendment and appreciate his general comments on the bill. I note, however, that if the committee supports uh, Mr Rumble's amendment, I would reserve the right to look further at the drafting before stage three in case there is any technical difficulties with it that have not yet come to light. Um, I also accept the principles behind Amendments 7, 8 and 116. However, I believe that there are some difficulties and gaps in their approach, and therefore, Convener, I offer to work with members to bring forward a government amendment at Stage 3 to capture the intentions of Amendments 7, 8 and 116, and in particular, the important objective of increasing the area of native woodland. As committee members may be aware, I have already made available increased grant support for native woodland creation in the Highland Council area in recognition of the substantial benefits that these woods can bring, uh, uh, an addition of uh, £400 per hectare of planting native woodland in that area. Uh, we are also developing work on woodland crofts and we also work closely uh, uh, with uh, bodies such as the Woodland Trust. So uh, I would, in conclusion, convener, ask members not to press these amendments, 7, 8 and 116, uh, uh, and to accept my offer to bring forward an appropriate Stage 3 amendment that addresses all three. Uh, finally, on Amendment 117, I've recognised the concerns of the forestry sector regarding the continued commitment of the Scottish Government to woodland expansion to underpin the sustainable timber products industry, which also ties in with our climate change ambitions to increase the amount of timber used in house building. And for that reason, I support Amendment 117. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'd ask Rader Grant to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 120, please. I'll reflect on some of the comments made and maybe come back at stage three with a, uh, an amended amendment. So I will not press at this moment. Okay. So does any other member present 
object to the amendment 118 being withdrawn. 120. Sorry, 120 being withdrawn. No, okay. So a call amendment one in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with amendment 120, Mike Rumbles to move or not move? Move. Okay, the question is that amendment one be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yes, we are agreed. So I call Amendment 7 in the name of Peter Chapman, already debated with Amendment 120. Peter Chapman, to move or not move? To move. OK. So the question is that Amendment B 7 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. OK, we are not agreed. Therefore, I call a division. Those in favour of Amendment 7, please raise your hands. Those against Amendment 7, please raise your hands. Okay. And therefore... Uh, Are there any abstentions? Sorry? Are there any abstentions? Yeah, I'm just about to do that. Sorry. Uh, and any abstentions? One. Okay. So therefore, therefore, the votes in favour of amendment, uh, sorry, amendment seven is three, votes against seven, and there's one abstention. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed. I call the amendment eight in the name of John Finney, already debated with amendment 120. John Finney to move or not to move? Um, thank you, uh, convener. I, if I could just make a few comments first, please. Um, uh, I, I think you should move it or not move it at this stage. I think you can see it. Secretary, very briefly. Okay, if it's very brief, so in, in light of what the Cabinet Secretary said. That, it it is in light of what the Cabinet Secretary said, and, and you, you will understand that I'm very keen to, to have some um, definity to this, and also whether the figure would apply to all forester, the National Forest Estate. So I'll not press at this time and engage in further discussions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So does any other member present object? Sorry. Oh, sorry, not moved. Sorry, my mistake there. Therefore, call Amendment 116 in the name of Richard Lyle, already debated with Amendment 120. Richard Lyle, to move or not move? Uh, comment. In regard to uh, 116, I take it the, I respect the Cabinet Secretary's words. He is a very honourable man, and I look forward to working with him in regards to this, because I am set on... Uh, increasing the afforestation within Scotland, so I will withdraw on this occasion 116. OK, so that's not moved. So I call 117 in the name of Richard Lyle, already debated with Amendment 120. Richard Lyle, move or not move? Uh, move 117. OK, the question is that Amendment 117 <coughs> be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. We'll move on to the next grouping, which is Forest Strategy, Preparation, Revision and Reporting. I call Amendment 9 in the name of Peter Chapman, grouped with other amendments and shown in the groupings. I would have to point out at this stage that if Amendment 9 is agreed, I cannot call Amendment 15. Peter Chapman to move Amendment 9 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I mean, we've just heard that the, the Cabinet Secretary requires clarity uh, with the bill, and I think this is my uh, Amendment 9 provides a, a degree of clarity. I think we need... Uh, a review of the strategy every five years and a, and a refresh of the strategy every ten years. I think that is only right and proper. It, it, we need to, to have a, the ability to scrutinise how the, the, the strategy is moving forward. And, uh, you know, this is, this is an important addition, I believe, to the bill and, and requires, uh, I would hope, it would receive support. Um, Rhoda Grant's amendment... Uh, well, as, as the uh, convener uh, pointed out, would, would, would fall if mine was agreed. Fulton McGregor, uh, I don't agree with that amendment because I, I believe there's too much analysis there. Uh, it, it, would, it, would be, it would be over overly prescriptive uh, and would uh, w is far too detailed in, in this uh, in this uh, bill. Um, Claudia Beamish. Um, again, I, I would vote against. I think it's, it's far too burdensome on, on ministers and far too, too specific. Uh, 
Amendment 4, and, and Claudia Beamish's name I could, su could support. I think that's reasonable and, and logical. But Amendment 1, 2, 3, and Claudia Beamish's name I do not support. I mean, this is a forester bill. Why, why do we need to uh, get bogged down in deer management issues? There are, there are strategies in place uh, as regards deer management in other places, and it doesn't need to appear here, in my opinion. Um, Rhoda Grant's one, uh, as we have regard to the Kyoto Protocol, again, we're, we're already signed up to this. This is an international treaty. It has no place, I believe, in, in a forestry bill in, in Scotland. Uh, ditto for the next one, one to five. Um, one to six, I think, is, 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 is as above. Again, I think it's, uh, you know, these are international uh, agreements which are, are well understood and have no place in here. Um, ditto for one to seven. Um, one to eight, uh, communities, persons, policies. Uh, I, I'm, I'm against that again. It overrides uh, elements of agricultural tenancies, which I am against. The Amendment 16, I think I can support. Um, it adds another layer of scrutiny, which is, which is I think, fair and proper. Um, going over the page again, Rhoda Grant's one, uh, Amendment 17, uh, I can support. Uh, I think this gives a, a, a level of, of, of transparency, and which is fair and proper, and, and I can ag agree to that. Uh, the cabinet secretary's uh, wording I, tightens up the, the wording, which is uh, which is fine. Do I, I speak to Amendment 10? Um, I, I think that it's important that there's an annual report. We, it's important that the financial transparency is is there, and we can monitor uh, targets within the this forestry strategy. So I think an annual report is absolutely essential. And uh, to, to wind up on John Finney's uh, Amendment 130, um, I think my, uh, my Amendment 10 is, is superior. I think it, we need an annual report rather than a three-year report. Um, so with that, I will conclude. Thank you. Rhoda Grant, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 15, please, and any other amendments in the group you wish to? <coughs> um, I speak to my amendments in the group 15, 124, 125, 126, 127, 128, 16 and 17 and others in the group. It's important that the strategy is reviewed regularly to make sure it meets the needs of forestry and I would suggest that this is most important at the first strategy. My amendment is along similar lines as that or that Peter Chapman is proposing in Amendment 9 um, in that it sense sets timescales for review. However, I think my amendment allows greater flexibility in that the st strategy can continue without revision if that's not required. It does ensure that this decision will face scrutiny as Scottish ministers will have to publish an explanation as to why they have decided not to revise this strategy. Uh, uh, can I let you come in later, if I may? Um, okay. Um, I, I'm just I'm just trying to think is is to let because the groupings are quite big is to let people go through the groupings. But I mean, it's up to to Rhoda if she she would like if she's happy to take it. Otherwise, I'm very happy to bring Jamie in uh, at the end with with the other members that want to speak on particular amendments. I'm I'm not because I didn't um, start the group. I don't think I have a wind up. Um, no, yeah. in the group, so it would be maybe useful to hear what Jamie's asking so that I could give him clarity okay. because I don't uh, have Jim. a wind up. Thank you, Convener. I do appreciate what a grant take my intervention. I, I, it feels in, um, intuitively easier to intervene on that specific point whilst you're speaking on it, as it's such a large group, particularly. Um, but do you, does Rhoda Grant not feel, however, that uh, the addition of the uh, point two in her amendment published an explanation of why they have not? Uh, revise the strategy, give the ministers a bit of a, a get-out clause in that respect, and actually uh, making it mandatory that the strategy must be reviewed and refreshed um, actually makes it a more powerful amendment. I think there's 
the similarities between Peter Chapman's amendment and, and your own, but we would prefer to lock it down that the, the Minister must actually review the strategy as opposed to giving them this get-out-of-jail card in, in the second part of your amendment. I'm just keen to probe that further. I, I don't think it's a get-out-of-jail card. I think it's actually the opposite. A, for, a forestry strategy needs to be long-term just because of the nature of the industry. Um, and therefore, to be changing direction every five years I don't think would be helpful. But especially with the first strategy, there may be issues in it that are having in it unintended consequences and that would therefore need to be reviewed to make sure it's right. So, that, so allowing for a review but not making that perspective I think is the right way forward because the forest it would take a, a much more um, future it would look further into the future but if there was a problem you could review it but at the same time ministers can't just decide not to review it without giving an explanation that would then be scrutinized by this parliament so if there was a need for review then that I think would happen because it would have to come to this parliament and indeed this committee could um, recommend that a, a, review, a full review take place if, there was, if that was necessary. But it just means that people don't have to jump through all the hoops every five years. Um, if I can turn to amendments 124, 25 and 26. Um, these amendments add some international conventions um, and the <coughs> Kyoto Protocol to the list of things Scottish ministers must have regard to when preparing the strategy. We have in the past heavily depended on European legislation to work alongside other countries to ensure we follow best practice and protect our environment. Before too long, we will no longer have that protection and therefore it is good to ground our practice internationally to ensure we remain world leaders. It wasn't so long ago we had block, blocks of citrus spruce planted randomly around the countryside and forests planted on the flow country, releasing rather than capturing carbon. It will take us a long time to undo these wrongs, but we must ensure we never repeat past mistakes. I hope these amendments will go some way forward into ensuring that protection. Amendments 127 and 28 um, return to the theme of protecting communities. While forestry is a good thing in itself, it is important to use every lever at our disposal to grow and empower fragile communities. These two amendments add repopulation and agricultural businesses to the list of issues the Scottish Government must have regard to when preparing the strategy. One would hope that this would happen instinctively, but given the importance of these issues to our fragile communities, it's right that they are in the bill and given the, the, that protection and importance. Amendments 16 and 17 concern the consultation and parliamentary scrutiny of the strategy. Given so much of the detail surrounding forestry will be in the strategy, it's right that it should be widely consulted on and that the outcome of the consultation should be scrutinised by Parliament. The time frame given would allow, the allow a committee of the Parliament to take evidence and make recommendations to Scottish ministers on the strategy. Given the time that the strategy will cover, it's right that it should be fully tested to ensure it meets the needs of future generations. Um, can I also speak to some of the other amendments in the group? I, speak, I would support Claudia Bleemish's amendments and I will also listen to the debate on John Finney and Peter Chapman's amendments because I do believe there has to be a reporting mechanism. Um, so I'll listen to the debate and decide which of those to support in light of that. Thank you. And I call on Fulton McGregor to speak to Amendment 121 and other amendments in the group. Thanks, Convener. Uh, amendment 121 is concerned with the consultation requirements when the strategy is being prepared or revised. It uh, amends the duty to consult at Section 4 of the Bill to specify the general public must be consulted. Ministers must also consult, as it says, such bodies as they consider appropriate. And I believe this does conform with Scottish Government consultation good practice across a range of areas. And hopefully the government will recognise that appropriate consultation is fundamental to developing, reviewing and revising the strategy. I am happy to, to move that amendment in my name. Um, in relation to the other um, amendments in the grouping convener, um, I uh, will await with interest the, the debate and obviously Claudia Beamish uh, attending today, um, I welcome her input, but I do have some uh, concerns over them. The amendment 122 um, seems quite long, non-comprehensive list, and um, it, it's already covered uh, by principles in the land use strategy. 
and the other amendments 14 and 123 to 128 um, would appear to duplicate existing legislation as ministers already have a, a biodiversity uh, duty under the Nature Conservation Scotland Act 2004. Um, so, but I will await obviously the debate around that. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. I now call on Claudia Beamish to speak to Amendment 122 and any other amendments in the group. Claudia. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, amendment uh, 122 intends to ensure Scotland's wealth of forestry expertise is preserved in the new devolved arrangement, specifically in the preparation or revision of the forestry strategy. The bill currently requires members, of course, to consult uh, persons considered appropriate, whereas my amendment lists specific uh, requirements for those uh, to be consulted with. And I, I do appreciate the earlier comments that lists are, have their dangers, but I think it is important to highlight these, um, these particular areas. A sustainable forest industry can deliver multiple environmental, social, economic benefits for the public good. Indeed, this is sustainable development. To truly unlock these benefits, our forests needs to, need to be managed with an integrated and sustainable approach. Stakeholders from the forest industries and community and environment groups have shared their concerns that rearranging the Forestry Commission Scotland and Forest Enterprise Scotland could lead to a loss of forestry focus and expertise. The existing arrangements allow for resource and knowledge sharing and close working relationship with those on the forest floor. It would be a great loss if this joined up approach and vital expertise were lessened by the forestry and land management devolution, particularly in those sectors so important to climate change, biodiversity, economy and communities. So Amendment 122 requires ministers in the preparation or revision of the forestry strategy to consult with those with knowledge of social economic development and the other points which I have made. And I would also um, make the point that the land use strategy does not actually, as I understand it, have a statutory um, uh, uh, situation. I would also like to speak to Amendments 4 and 123, which I have put separately so that um, one or other could be supported, depending on the, the views. Um, and uh, Section 4 states that in preparation of the forestry strategy, strategy that Scottish ministers must A, consult with such persons as they consider appropriate, and B, have regard to the land use strategy and um, land rights and responsibilities statement. The two policies there mentioned should certainly be included in this exercise. However, the list is not, in my view, complete. And there are other important policies that are relevant to the forest strategy which should be included here. These amendments are needed to ensure that biodiversity and deer management, two essential components, in my view, of achieving sustainable forest management, are recognised on the face of the bill. And I'm not going to go into the details of where they're also referred to in other acts, um, uh, but I, I, I want to reiterate that particularly um, the, the um, amendment addresses one of the points made in the bill by my own committee in its letter to this committee at stage one, in which I quote, we state that the committee is unclear as to what degree wider policy objectives including those related to biodiversity, deer management and climate change, are reflected in the bill and, in particular, are to be taken into account in the preparation of the forest strategy. The committee also considers there is merit in including the need to have regard to biodiversity and deer management requirements on the face of the bill. And finally, um, this, uh, this Your Own Committee, in its Stage 1 reports, um, uh, report states, the committee believes the strong links between forestry and policy areas, and I won't quote them all, uh, but they are, they are listed there, um, biodiversity is listed, but I must point out not deer management uh, in the case of your own committee, but it does note that the Scottish Government's awareness of its existing statutory commitments. However, it is clear that stakeholders are seeking reassurance and the need for this policy integration will be clear and unambiguous and that there will be a, requir a requirement for it to be delivered. Um, so I thank um, members and the Cabinet Secretary for listening to the points I've made and I would also like to support Rhoda Grant's amendments and uh, uh, coming as I do from the um, uh, Eclair Committee, I will most certainly want to be supporting the climate change um, amendment, but the others as well, and I think um, Rhoda Grant's point, if I may say so, is well made about um, as we head towards um, 
uh, the, the Brexit situation, that it is important that we recognise other um, international agreements and tie ourselves to those um, in, the, in our important forestry sector. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on John Finney to speak to Amendment 130 um, and any other amendments in the group. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Convener. It, it, it is um, 1.30. I'm speaking to you about the preparation of the forest strategy contained in Section 4 uh, and the relationship of the Bill to overarching policy objectives and um, suggesting a reporting period of uh, three years. Um, Section 4 states that in preparing the forest strategy, Scottish ministers must a, consult such persons as they consider appropriate and b, have regard to the land use strategy and the land rights and responsibility statement. The, the two policies mentioned should certainly be included in this exercise, but that's not a complete list in my view. And there are uh, other very important policies that are relevant to the forest strategy which should be included. Now, having listened to my colleague and dear friend Claudia speak earlier, we've obviously um, a very similar view on what's important here, but I'm not going to repeat um, many of the things she said, but um, I will say that the amendment is needed to ensure biodiversity and deer management, two essential components in achieving sustainable forest management uh, that are recognised on the face of the bill. And uh, this will ensure the forest strategy contributes to the delivery of public policy objectives in these two areas. Um, <coughs> This subsection should include references to the strategy or strategies while uh, Scottish ministers are required to designate the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy under Section 2 of the Nature Conservation Scotland Act 2004 and the Code of Practice and Deer Management, which SNH is required to prepare and keep under review in accordance with Section 5A of the Deer Scotland Act 1996. And indeed, the, the Nature Conservation Scotland Act 2004 requires all public bodies to have regard to the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy. And that strategy recognises the importance of native woodland for Scottish di um, biodiversity and sets ambitious native woodland planting targets in the strategy's route map. Um, now, there's a, a voluntary code of practice on deer management, and that places a responsibility on all land managers to manage wild deer, which are highly pertinent to what we're discussing. Deer live in woods and deer eat trees, um, highly pertinent. Um, and has aims to integrate deer management with other land use objectives such as woodland creation and the regeneration targets. In the code, the concept of responsible deer management focuses on three things, managing deer as a resource, sustainably minimising negative deer impacts on public interests and safeguarding deer welfare. Now, I also was going to quote from Claudia's committee's report, the clear report. I won't, I think it's a highly pertinent uh, reference. Our own report at stage one did comment on the, the strong links between forestry and policy areas such as land use, planning, community empowerment, climate change. So moving to the other amendments in the group, um, I was prepared to, to wait and hear what uh, colleagues uh, Peter Chapman and Rhoda Grant said, and I certainly favour Rhoda Grant's position and will be, be supporting that, likewise Fulton McGregor's. As regards um, Claudia Beamish's um, uh, amendments, uh, I, again, we'll be supporting these, and I thought it was... Um, uh, whoever commented that it was restrictive, quite the reverse. If you, if you prepare a list, uh, you say in particular, that's not an exclusive list, and, and uh, I'm, I'm quite sure that Claudia would anticipate the fullest consultation on these issues. Um, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. I, now, I am going to call some other members to speak, and I just want to make it clear that just because you've spoken already doesn't mean that you can't come back in if there's a point that if you were at the beginning of the debate or halfway through that you can't come back in. So it shouldn't be restrictive if you've already spoken. That is not an excuse to allow everyone then to, to repeat their arguments. Please, but Stuart, first of all. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Uh, turning to the Leader Amendment, Peter Chapman's number nine. Um, the idea that you can only undertake scrutiny if you make this amendment, I think, is an entirely false one. Indeed, putting that in here allows ministers off the hook because it gives to them the responsibility to use scrutiny, whereas Parliament should be the one who decides timetables and scrutiny. In other words, if after 18 months it's the right time to do scrutiny and Parliament thinks that or a committee thinks that, then it should do the scrutiny and it should be in control of that. But if, it, if we say it's five years and ten years, it's, it's just a nuanced issue. I'm not saying it's a principled issue, but I think scrutiny should be in the control of Parliament rather than put in 
Britain in, in, in quite the way that Peter Chapman does. Now, having said that, I think uh, uh, Amendment 130 from John Finney, because we have a choice of approaches here in, in the amendments in the group, um, it offers the, 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 the best of the bunch. Although I have a wee difficulty uh, with uh, Section 3A, uh, which starts the period when the bill receives royal assent, um, I suspect we might have to look at that at stage three if we pass this, because I think it's more likely that the right time would be either at commencement or when the strategy is adopted, that the three-year clock. But, but that's a detail that can be dealt with uh, at uh, a later date. Claudia Beamish's uh, 122 um, it perfectly illustrates the danger of lists in primary legislation, not against lists in secondary legislation, where you can change them very rapidly as needs require. But, for example, it, it doesn't include in the list um, the use of forests for public good. Um, now, I accept that it says consult in particular, but the moment you produce a list and say in particular, you demote all other uh, ways in which uh, you might consult to a lesser level than those you choose to put in the list. And I just don't like lists in broad principle in primary legislation while having no objection to them uh, in secondary legislation where they can be amended uh, quickly as required. Now, by the same token, uh, for 123, 24, 25, 26 and 127, uh, Sorry, I beg your pardon, I'll leave 127 for the moment, um, down to 126. These are all matters which already bind us, um, as the UK is signatories um, to the protocols, uh, or alternatively, they are part of our legislative framework uh, in Form 123. And again, once you start to stick in, in the manner of a list, you demote by implication things you choose uh, not to to put in there. One, two, seven, I've, I've less objection to. Uh, I, th I think there is uh, some uh, merit in that. And finally, convener, uh, number 17, I think the construction of the amendment at uh, paragraph B has a serious flaw. It says any representations received as a result of the consultation the government must publish. Uh, that appears to remove the right of people who wish to submit a representation without their details being published uh, from, uh, the, 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 that would require the government to publish such things. Uh, so I think just in the construction of it, there is a, a technical flaw that uh, would mean I couldn't readily support uh, uh, amendment uh, 17. Convener. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike, you're next. Um, I think we're given uh, alternative approaches to revision reporting here. Um, I much prefer Peter's amendments 9 and 10 to the others. Um, if I could say so, I don't agree with um, my colleague Stuart Stevenson on, on the point that Peter's section uh, amendment number 9 lets the government off the hook. It does precisely the opposite. Mm. Um, this amendment that Peter has put forward, as I read it, is giving Parliament the authority. It is ex doing exactly the opposite of what Stuart is suggesting because, uh, no, I've heard what you've said and I'm, cont I'm contradicting you because <laughs> I don't believe that you are correct. Um, what we're doing in Parliament, as a committee of Parliament, are, is instructing the government or requiring the government and maybe instructing is too strong a word, but requiring the government to come back and do this. And I'm sure the government thinks this, this is a, is a, should be appropriate. I can't see what the problem with it is, because I think with, with, with Amendment 9 and 10, it's giving the government greater time to do this, but it's putting into legislation the requirement to do it. So this is Parliament being in charge and not the government. So I entirely disagree with the position taken by Stuart. Um, I agree that uh, with Fulton's Amendment 121, this, I think this amendment is a good practice on consultation. And uh, I'm certainly happy to support Fulton's Amendment 121. On the others, I'm afraid, I, I, I can't support them on the grounds that we've got a situation where we're taking this forestry bill through, we've called for evidence, we've taken evidence on the whole, the whole bill, where have we taken evidence on the voluntary code of practice on deer management? We have, we've spent a great deal of time in stage one going through all of this, and then suddenly to have 
an amendment thrown at us that talks about um, the, the code of practice. Of, yes, I will. I'm grateful for the member taking intervention. Would the member accept that this piece of legislation will not stand in splendid isolation from other pieces of legislation and codes? Thank you. That is exactly my point. It doesn't it's not necessary to have it here. That's the entirely the point that I am making, and I'm glad that John Finney supports my point of view. Um, so I think, I think I've been comprehensive enough, and I'll close at that point. Thank you. Uh, next, um, in a, well, Jamie was next, and, and then Claudia, I'll come back to you if I may. J Jamie. Thank you, Ravina. Uh, if I may just speak very briefly to uh, Amendments 9 and 10. Um, I, my understanding is that there is quite acceptable precedence um, in uh, five year, uh, uh, ten year reviews and refresh is refreshes. Um, I, I do believe this is very similar to the language we're using in another bill which this committee is considering, the Islands Bill, and that seems to be quite acceptable to the government that, uh, uh, that the five and ten year time frames are um, quite adequate for, for Parliament to scrutinise the strategy. And on point uh, Amendment 10, um, uh, from speaking to industry stakeholders who had initial concerns about the overarching um, rationale behind this act and the, the integration of the Forest Commission into uh, Scottish Government departments, they feel that an annual report is quite a vital part of the uh, ongoing governance of the uh, strategy um, and indeed that it would be prudent for the government to report on an annual basis, uh, including uh, financial reporting, as they are currently used to from the Forestry Commission, and this amendment would uh, ensure that that is ongoing and that that would not slip in any way from the status quo. So that's my comments on those amendments. Thank you. Claudia, you wanted to come in. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, it was just in response to um, uh, Member Stuart Stevenson's point about, in particular, persons with experience and knowledge of, um, it may be that it might be more appropriate for um, me to consider withdrawing the amendment at this stage and using the word including rather than in particular. Um, and so I, I'm listening to that, that point that um, the members raised. Um, also, I'd like to highlight the issue of why, um, why is it unacceptable to have um, any list um, added to um, in relation to both Rhoda Grant's amendments and my own, uh, in that we already have in Section 4B, I quote, have regard to land use strategy and the right, uh, land rights and responsibility statement. So we do already have a precedent within the bill, on the face of the bill, for putting important um, strategies and, um, and declarations in there. Uh, so I just raised that point. And also in relation to Mike Rumble's um, comment, uh, deer management was indeed highlighted um, by, my, uh, by the um, Eclair Committee in our letter um, at the stage one, uh, and I had attended a number of the the, of these, um, uh, the, the meetings of this committee, and I also did um, raise it and highlight it in the stage one debate. So it has been highlighted before, so I just make that point. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, convener, and uh, another interesting discussion uh, which even contains moments of entertainment, something that's not always present in stage two debates, of my experience. So. I'm grateful to all members and uh, to Claudia Beamish, Peter Chapman, Rhoda Grant, Fulton McGregor and John Finney for lodging these amendments and I do support the intentions of a number of them. And I'm also pleased with the cross-party support for the development of the forestry strategy. It is heartening there's a strong agreement on all sides that the strategy needs to reflect the broad-based, multifunctional nature of Scotland's forests and woodlands. And again, Convener, I would emphasise that I'm committed to working with all parties to develop and improve this part of the bill. Before I turn to address specific amendments, I, I wanted to reflect that by its very nature, the completion of devolution of forestry will result in enhanced levels of scrutiny of forestry by this Scottish Parliament. I think that's something of which we should not lose sight and something to be welcomed and borne in mind uh, when framing the legislation on the strategy. I also observe the processes for publishing, reviewing and scrutinising the forestry strategy must be proportionate and enabling and I believe we must avoid putting into law requirements that ultimately may impede the publication of the strategy or place barriers in the way of revision. And I know that 
That's something that the sector has expressed reservations about. <coughs> Amendments 9 and 15, I think, are perhaps alternatives, uh, convener, and they deal with the review and refresh of the forestry strategy. And in considering these, I, I would ask members to note two important points and perhaps refer to section to the wording of section 3 of the bill, which will be before members. Section 3, subsection 4, already requires Scottish ministers to keep the forestry strategy under review and states that they may, if they consider it appropriate, revise the, the, the strategy. So, so thus far, that is contained within the, the bill as it stands. Secondly, as I said to the committee during stage one, I am mindful that the forestry sector depends on a long-term, stable policy environment uh, and that's important to ensure ongoing investment, which I believe we, we all recognise is required. And it's therefore vital that the review cycle for the strategy is of appropriate length. Uh, and I believe that fixing the strategy into a five yearly review cycle is not sufficiently long term. It's shorter than the current CAP cycle of seven years. And I would comment in passing that that fact, that discontinuity, uh, has proven to be a problem for sustaining consistent forestry activity. Um, however, I am committed to making sure that the strategy remains up to date and relevant. Uh, and therefore, I would ask members not to press these two amendments as drafted on the basis that I commit to coming back at stage three with an amendment that sets out an appropriate review cycle and revision cycle of no more than 10 years. Uh, now, I, perhaps I'd point out, convener, what members will, I suspect, know very well, that, um, that as well as forestry being a long-term process, that the period from planting to maturation, even of the tree, the species that grows most quickly, is 40 years, and can be up to 80 years or longer in different species. So we're talking of 40 to 80 years, a long, long-term business. If there was to be a strategy review every five years, uh, then even taking the fastest growing species, which I, I believe, although I'm an expert, to be sick of spruce, that would mean there would be eight strategy reviews between planting and maturation. Is that consistent with the approaches that I believe we wish to take to... Uh, uh, yes, I certainly will. I'll just finish the point. You know, is, we're talking here about five years versus a longer period of up to ten years uh, 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 and is a five-year period of sufficient length. I would suggest with great respect that because we are talking unusually about a very, very long-term process, that uh, the statutory requirement for review should not be embedded in, in the legislation. However, I want to make a further point that this parliament uh, is sovereign over the Scottish Government. This parliament at any time uh, when this bill is passed and becomes law uh, can require the government to review the strategy. And in the circumstances where a review, of course, was necessary, then I would fully expect that members would, use, uh, would be scrutinising this government uh, and demanding a strategy review. So I wanted to point that, that, that uh, matter out, although Mr Rumbles, I think, did make the point well earlier. Mr Green, if he wants to intervene, convener is happy to do so. Yeah, uh, I do thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking my intervention. Um, would he not accept, though, that uh, review of the strategy doesn't necessarily interpret uh, a complete overhaul of the strategy? Indeed, it, wouldn't it be prudent to uh, have that um, five-year refresh? Uh, wouldn't it seem appropriate that uh, Parliament and, indeed, the public should be afforded at least once review uh, within uh, a parliamentary cycle, given that they are five years, and that we would expect of the government within a five-year parliamentary cycle at least one refresh of the, the, the or one review of the strategy in whichever form that review takes? Uh, well, not, not really. I mean, I, th I think that, uh, as I say, this, this parliament and future parliaments can always require governments to do, th <coughs> excuse me, to do things. And indeed, <coughs> this, this parliament has done so in the field of uh, rural affairs uh, uh, by requiring the government to do things. And uh, I hope we have acted on that. For example, the National C Committee of Rural Advisors. <coughs> Um, we don't always uh, uh, make every member absolutely happy about the outcomes, but we did act following Parliament. That's just one example. So Parliament can require a review. What I'm saying is that this should not be set <coughs> in the law as something that must be done uh, within a period which 
for forestry being such a long-term nature, uh, five years is, I believe, too, too short. Um, however, I want to, to emphasise that, that if uh, the, uh, the authors of Amendments 9 and 15 accept my commitment to work with them and to come back uh, at Stage 3 with, a, 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 with an amendment that sets out an appropriate review cycle and revision cycle of no more than 10 years, uh, then I would be happy to work with them on the basis that they do not uh, uh, press their amendments today. Turning to amendments uh, 121 and 122 from Mr McGregor and Ms Beamish, <clears throat> I do recognise that appropriate consultation is fundamental to developing, reviewing and revising the strategy. Of course it is, and that, that is the approach I think it's fair to say the government takes in, in respect of all its policy formulation. But to be appropriate, this needs to reflect the, the needs of the time and not include partial lists which risk becoming rapidly um, out of date. And I, I think Mr Stevenson did, um, did give an example of uh, a type of potential consultee that was not included in this list. Uh, although Ms Beamish may say that the, the reference is to consult in particular, so she would say that that doesn't exclude the consultation of others, to be fair to her. I think the more fundamental objection, uh, I mean, I, I, the, the government is not in favour of, of uh, long exclusive lists in primary legislation because they can date quite quickly and fail to draw in relevant uh, matters. Uh, but perhaps uh, an even more telling objection is to look at the particular wording which says that the, the uh, Scottish government would consult in particular persons with experience or knowledge of various things. That then, convener, imports a duty on the Scottish Government to carry out some form of process to ascertain who does and who does not possess experience or knowledge. That, I suspect, would be a highly contentious uh, process. It would involve subjective judgments to be made. Inevitably, these would be controversial. I see no easy way of deciding myself who has knowledge and who doesn't. And indeed, the process of judging someone to have no experience or no knowledge or insufficient experience or insufficient knowledge would, I think, be a somewhat odious one uh, and not one that uh, I think any government could easily or readily perform without a great deal of difficulty and controversy. And I'm sure that this is not a matter which Claudia Beamish, with respect to her, would at all uh, wish to occur, but I hope by having made the point, members can see that it is a kind of common sense one pointing to um, an infelicity, a technical infelicity in draftsmanship. Uh, so um, I would respectfully <coughs> therefore ask Claudia Beamish not to press Amendment 122 and instead ask members to support Amendment 121 in the name of Mr McGregor, which I think Mr Rumbles pointed out is in the, the normal customary form, which imports a duty to consult fairly widely and, and I must say I'm not particularly aware of any cases where the Scottish Government has been accused of failing to consult the right people in consultations, uh, uh, although of course if I'm wrong no doubt uh, I will hear about that. Um, on Amendment 128 I don't believe it's helpful to list a specific singular group of stakeholders and I believe this amendment covers the same ground as the duty in Section 4 which is to have regard to the land use strategy which contains a specific principle that people should have opportunities to contribute to decisions about land use decisions which affect their lives and their future. Therefore, I ask members not to press amendments 4, 123, 124, 125, 126, 127 and 128 and I accept a commitment that the government will return at stage 3 with an amendment that delivers the improved policy alignment that members wish to see without creating a long and exclusive list on the face of the bill. Turning uh, to, finally, uh, no, not finally, turning penultimately to Amendment 16 and 17 on the important question of parliamentary scrutiny, I fully support the principle of appropriate scrutiny and oversight of the Scottish forestry strategy, but believe the process and timescales outlined are disproportionate given the, the scope and scale of the strategy this appears to be the same process required for the Climate Change Bill, which is a much larger, complex and multi-sectoral document. Uh, I would suggest there may be alternative, more proportionate approaches that would meet Parliament's desire for scrutiny whilst ensuring sufficient time for 
the crucial processes of completing the strategy before the 1st of April 2019. I agree with the process as laid out in Amendment 17 for laying an explanatory document represents good practice and therefore ask Rhoda Grant not to pre press these amendments and offer to bring forward uh, a, a government amendment at stage three that lays out an appropriate process for parliamentary oversight of the forestry strategy. And finally, on amendments 10 and 130 on uh, the issue of reports, I believe that a three-yearly reporting cycle is an appropriate term to update Parliament on progress with the implementation of the strategy, as this reflects the slowly changing nature of forestry. So I support Amendment 130 in the name of John Finney, but would like to bring forward an amendment at Stage 3 to ensure that the reporting cycle starts once a strategy has been published. Also, I will want to consider how the requirement for a three-yearly reporting cycle should inform the amendments I offer at Stage 3 on reviewing the strategy and parliamentary scrutiny of it, and as I indicated earlier, I offer to work with all parties on these sections of the bill. Uh, in conclusion, uh, convener, I, I, uh, in consequence of my support for John Finney's Amendment 130, I would respectfully ask Peter Chapman not to press Amendment 10, which proposes annual reports, recognising that the key forestry statistics, such as the area of new woodland created, will continue to be published annually as national statistics and uh, Forest and Land Scotland, a, which will replace Forest Enterprise as an agency, will produce annual reports as has Forest Enterprise. So those annual reports will, will uh, continue, although they will be provided by the new agency, Forest and Land Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I'm now going to ask Peter Chapman to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 9, please. Uh, thank you, Convener. I think I, I need to progress and press uh, uh, Amendment 9. I think it's, it's absolutely important that uh, there is a review every five years. A, par the, a Parliament lasts for five years. I, I appreciate what the Cabinet Secretary has told us about the lifetime of a tree, and it is considerably more than five years. I accept that, but we're not speaking about the lifetime of a tree. We're speaking more about the lifetime of a Parliament here, and, the, and that can change radically in, in, in a five-year period. And I believe it's correct and right that, that the, the, the strategy does have a, a review every five years. And I, 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 I am grateful for the support from, uh, from uh, Mike Rumbles and, and Jamie Green and what they said in, in support of what the, my amendment wishes to achieve. And I think it is important that uh, that clarity is in there, uh, that the, any new parliament gets an opportunity to have a look at the strategy and, and then every 10 years it's refreshed. So I, 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 push, I, I, I move that uh, amendment in, in my name. Um, as regards uh, Amendment 10, I hear what the Cabinet Secretary has, has, has to say about annual reports. Um, I think an annual report is, is quite a, a, a normal procedure for, for, for any organisation. Most, most organisations do produce a, an annual report. Um, and I think it's, it's important that there's that layer of, of transparency and there, there's that... Uh, it, it, and I, I again, uh, would, uh, would move that uh, we uh, accept uh, my Amendment 10. And with that, I will... will uh, Leave it there, convener. Okay. Thank you. The, the question, therefore, is that Amendment 9 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Oh. Okay. So, therefore, uh, the agreement... Uh, I call a division. Uh, can I ask those in favour of Amendment 9 to raise their hands, please? Those against Amendment 9... And any abstentions? Okay, therefore there are, there are four votes for, six against, one abstention, therefore Amendment 9 is not carried. I therefore call Amendment 15 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 9. Rhoda Grant, to move or not to move? Given the Cabinet Secretary's comments, I'll not move at this stage. Okay, Ad, is there any other member... Oh, no, I don't need to do that. Do I? I just move straight on to ask the question, is, is Section 3 agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Good. I call Amendment 121 in the name of Fulton McGregor, already debated with Amendment 9. Fulton McGregor to move or not move? Moved. 
Okay. The question is that Amendment 121 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. I call a division. Those in favour, please raise your hands. Th those against. And there are no abstentions, so there are eight votes for, three votes against. Therefore, Amendment 121 is agreed. I call in Amendment 122 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 9. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Thank you, Gavina. Um, in view of the points raised by the Cabinet Secretary um, and also uh, Stuart Stevenson, at this stage I will withdraw the amendment, but I, I will consider possibly in dialogue with the Cabinet Secretary whether it is indeed on the face of the bill or elsewhere. Um, bringing, bring this back at stage three because I do think that there has been an, a considerable amount of stakeholder concern on this issue and, and so I withdraw at this stage. In relation to... Uh, uh, sorry, I'll wait. Sorry, okay, convener. if you can wait and just confirm to me you are not moving the amendment. I'm I not understand, it. I'm understand the word withdraw for, for procedure. It means to be not moved. Therefore, I call amendment four in the name of Claudia Beamish already debated with amendment mine nine. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Uh, in view, convener uh, of the Cabinet Secretary's um, points made, uh, I, I will withdraw at this stage not and moved. would be happy if it's uh, appropriate to have further discussion. So I'm not moving that amendment. Thank you. So therefore I call Amendment 123 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 9. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Uh, I'm not going to move, convener. I do think that... Um, in recognition of the serious concerns on deer management that I would also like to um, have some assurance that it might be possible to discuss this further in relation to the forest um, bill. Thank you. Thank you. Therefore, I move on to Amendment 124 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 9. Rhoda Grant, to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Therefore, I call Amendment 125 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 9. Rhoda Grant, move or not move? Not move. Okay. I call Amendment 126 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 9. Rhoda Grant, move or not move? Not move. Fine. I call Amendment 127 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 9. Rhoda Grant, move or not move? Not move. Okay, I call Amendment 128 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 9. Rhoda Grant, move or not move? Not move. The question, therefore, at this stage is that Section 1, 4 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Okay, I'm now calling Amendment 16 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 9. Rhoda Grant, to move or not move? Not move. Okay, I call Amendment 17 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 9. To Rhoda Grant, to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. The question, therefore, at this stage is Section 5 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, we now move on to a separate grouping, which is land managed by the Scottish Ministers. I'm going to call Amendment 18 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with other amendments as shown within the groupings. I would point out that if Amendment 38 is agreed to, I cannot call <coughs> Amendment 39 in the group disposable of land with compulsory <coughs> purchase of land. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 18 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. This set of uh, Scottish Government amendments has been lodged in response to stakeholder and parliamentary feedback at Stage 1. A number of stakeholders and the committee sought greater clarity on the bill's duties relating to land management. Specifically, clarity was sought on the land that is to be managed under Section 9 of the bill for the purposes of sustainable forest management and the land that is to be managed under Section 13 to further the achievement of sustainable development. I have listened to the concerns raised and received many helpful suggestions as to how the sections might usefully be reframed. I'm pleased to lodge amendments uh, that uh, address the issues raised and have been welcomed by the forestry sector as providing helpful clarification. In response to questions about how land to be managed under each duty would be identified, my amendments induce, introduce a simple determining characteristic upon which the decision will be made, namely, land that is forested must be managed under the Section 9 duty for sustainable forestry management. Uh, forest management. 
That land that is not forested will be managed under Section 13 duty to further sustainable development. Amendments 24 to 26, 27 to 31 acknowledge this change and reframe the Section 9 duty to apply to forested land rather than forestry land. As amended, Section 10 will define forested land to include both land in the National Forest Estate that is forested and land which is otherwise owned or managed by Scottish ministers and forested. Taken together, the effect is that all forested land owned or managed by Scottish ministers will be managed under the Section 9 duty in accordance with sustainable forest management. For the purposes of the Bill, forested includes land undergoing a forestation. <coughs> The bill, as introduced, identifies the power for ministers to manage forestry land for the purposes of sustainable development. That provided the ability to move land between the forestry land management duty and the sustainable development land management duty. Due to the introduction of forested as the characteristic of the land that will determine the duty, that power is no longer needed and is removed from the bill by Amendment 26. I've explained that Section 10, as amended, will define forested land to include the forested parts of the National Forest Estate. Amendment 38 specifies that the non-forested parts of the NFE are to be managed under the Section 13 duty to further sustainable development with other non-forested land. I know that some stakeholders had concerns that the bill as introduced implied that all of the National Forest Estate was forested and that labelling it as forestry land was misleading. I hope that this approach, which recognises the nature of the estate as one-third open land, allays that concern. The division of the NFE between the two land management duties will be achieved by the allocation of management blocks to each duty based on the detailed inventory held by Forest Enterprise Scotland. The uh, inventory covers the entire estate and includes information on what land is forested and not forested. New acquisitions of land and land managed, managed on behalf of other people under Section 14 of the Bill will be allocated based on the same basis according to whether they are forested or non-forested. The definition of the National Forest Estate in the Bill is amended in consequence of the changes to Section 10 and 13.2. New acquisitions of land, if forested, will automatically come under the Section 9 duty and do not need to be labelled as NFE to do so. For this reason, the definition of the NFE in the Bill is amended to simply mean the land in Scotland currently under management by the Forestry Commissioners that will transfer to Scottish Ministers on devolution. The definition at Section 11 is further amended so that only land that remains in the ownership of Ministers is included. This is to ensure that the land management duties cease if ownership changes. Amendments 18 to 22 make consequential amendments to section 6 of the bill, which places duties on ministers to have regard to the forestry strategy when performing certain functions. The effect of these is to require ministers to have regard to the strategy when managing forested land, acquiring land under the bill and disposing of forested land. I hope that members will consider that these amendments provide the clarity that was sought around the operation of the land management powers in the Bill, and I would encourage members to support them, and I move Amendment 18. Thank you. There's no, there's no members wishing to speak on this, so Cabinet Secretary, as you've moved Amendment 18, I'm going to put a question to the Committee, and the question is that Amendment 18 be, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. It's agreed. Therefore, I'm proposing to call amendments 19, 20 and 21, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and as previously debated. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 19 to 21 on block. Does any member object... Sorry. Sorry. Moved on block. Okay. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 19 to 21? No. I, yes, I, I object. Okay. So, therefore, I'm, I'm going to put each, a question on each of the amendments individually. So, the first question is Amendment 19 in the name of the, of the Cabinet Secretary is agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. No. Okay, we're not agreed. I call a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against? Three. No abstention, so that... That's eight votes for, three votes against. I therefore move on to Amendment 20 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. No.
were not agreed. I call a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Any abstentions? No. There are eight votes in favour, three votes against. I call Amendment 21 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. And then move on to the next grouping, disposals of land and compulsory purchase. I'm going to call the Amendment 2 in the name of Mike Rumbles, grouped with other amendments as shown in the groupings. I must remind members that if Amendment 38 from group land managed by Scottish ministers is agreed, I cannot call Amendment 39 in this group. I must further point out that if Amendment 41 is agreed, I cannot call Amendment 42. Mike Rumbles, please move Amendment 2 and speak to that amendment and the amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I move Amendment 2 before I forget to do so. Um, I'd like, just like to thank the um, Minister for accepting my first amendment um, in the spirit it was, it was lodged. And Amendments 2 and 3 are simply um, consequential amendments. And therefore, I'm not going to spend a great deal of t time on them. And I hope the Minister will, will, will accept that and members of the committee will, will, will accept that. It doesn't really... Uh, because we've accepted Amendment 1, I think it's logical to accept Amendments 2 and 3. I would like to spend my time, however, focusing on the other amendments, which um, is actually the one controversial, I really think the one, from my personal view, the one controversial issue in the whole of the, of the bill. And, and in stage one, we took a great deal of evidence on the, um, the proposal to transfer compulsory purchase of land uh, from the 67 bill to uh, act to, to, this, to this bill. And in our report, we focused on that and we didn't think, well, while, while we thought it was fine to transfer those powers, we didn't think it was fine to enhance the, the powers. And in the division, the majority of the committee um, voted to make that clear in the stage one report. Uh, I was rather hopeful that the minister might have taken that on board, um, and I was rather hopeful that the minister might have brought forward the amendments to do this. Uh, he obviously hasn't done so, and the, the actual amendments, 39, 6 and 42, which, is the, which are the key amendments to this, have been brought forward by, by Peter Chapman. Um, this reflects the view that we took as a, in a majority, in a majority vote, uh, at stage one, and here we are again now at stage two, and one would hope that the members of the committee who voted this way in stage one would vote the same way now in stage two. I can't think what has changed unless there is guidance being given to members um, from various sources to suggest that they change their minds. And I'm hopeful that members of the committee are stronger than that. And I think you'll have a moment to, to speak, John, if you want to speak. Uh, I, I don't see the need to intervene on me. I'm just trying to make a point. Um, I do well remember when I, when I took, um, in the first parliament, my first, my first stage two debate, I had a, an envelope passed to me with guidance uh, from, the, from, from the government. The executive, as we called it at the time, I, I, I didn't even read it. I just put it in the envelope, wrote the minister's name back on the envelope, and handed it back, because I think we'd have a, a job in this committee, in Parliament, to look at the evidence, to examine the evidence, and make our own minds up in the committee. And I would hope, and I'm very confident, that members of this committee have the strength of character to do the right thing. And uh, I, I would end on that point. Thank you. I'm now going to move to Peter Chapman to speak to Amendment 39 and other amendments in the group. Sorry, Ms. Lark, I would ask if we could follow this just so we, we get through. The, you'll get a chance to speak if you want to. So, Peter Chapman, to speak to Amendment 39 and other amendments in this group. Thank you, Convener. I would uh, like to speak to 39 and, and Amendment 6 in my name. This is a very important part. Uh, we have, uh, and to me, to my mind, this is a, a red line area here, that uh, this is about compulsory purchase powers. 
and uh, the, the proposal to increase compulsory purchase powers to uh, allow purchase for sustainable development. And I am very strongly against uh, adding extra powers under th this uh, compulsory purchase powers rules. We are content to roll over the powers that exist in the, in the 67 Act because we do agree that in certain circumstances compulsory powers may, may be necessary. But to extend these compulsory purchase powers to, to include sustainable development, I think it opens it far too wide. Uh, it, it gives ministers far too much power, and I think it, it, it is completely unnecessary. It, it, we need to reflect on the fact that although there are compulsory powers in the existing uh, 67 Act, in the 50 years that they have been there, they have never actually been used. So, you know, to think that it is necessary to increase these powers and widen these powers, I, uh, I, I cannot understand the thinking behind that. And I think this is an absolutely important part that we, we need to amend. So I would, I would uh, hope that I can uh, receive support uh, for, this, uh, for these two amendments. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr Chapman. Cabinet Secretary, would you like to speak to Amendment 40 and other amendments in the group? Uh, yes, sir. Just, uh, here we are. Um, well, I will deal first with the amendments relating to the disposal of land before turning to those on compulsory purchase. <clears throat> first Amendment 41, in my name, flows from the Government amendments on management of land by Scottish ministers, and the effect of these amendments was to change the definitions of forested land at Section 10 and of the National Forest Estate at Section 11. Section 17 of the Bill deals with disposals of land. The purpose of um, Amendment 41 is to reframe Section 17 to ensure that ministers may dispose not only of land in the National Forest Estate but also other forest, forested land that they own that is not part of the estate. For example, forested land acquired under the Bill. Um, further, Amendment 41 amendment amends Section 17 so that ministers may dispose of non-forested land they have acquired under the bill. <coughs> Turning to amendments two and three, I understand from Mr Rumbles that these are consequential to his amendment one. Uh, I supported that amendment, therefore it follows that I support these amendments too. I note, however, that before uh, stage three, I would like to take a look at the potential interaction between these amendments and the government's own amendments relating to land management in case there are any unintended consequences that need to be addressed. I think Mr Rumbles would expect he appreciates that as a necessary process. Um, turning to Amendments 12 and 12A uh, in Mr Finney's name and amend Amendment 12A in Mr Green's name, these are both about the hypothecation of funds relating to disposals of land on the National Forest Estate. Mr Finney's amendment seeks to use funds from the disposal of land solely for the purposes and functions set out in the Bill. Mr Green's amendment goes even further, restricting the use of the funds to buy land for forestry and not for any other functions. I do understand the intention behind the amendments, but I don't think it's necessary to set them out in primary legislation, convener. There are, I believe, other more appropriate mechanisms for, ex for examining the government policy on disposals. As the committee has recognised, it's already current practice for forest enterprise to reinvest income in the National Forest Estate enabling reconfiguration of the estate to meet strategic priorities, including new woodland uh, creation. I would point out also that there is also investment in other non-forestry purposes, such as recreation, such as tourism, such as the provision of services for people with mental health issues. And therefore, to restricting things simply to forestry, I think, would be unduly restricting, and perhaps not what Mr. Mr. Green may have intended. Uh, forest enterprises... Scotland's existing framework document already sets out the policy on disposals and acquisitions and the criteria for selection of land that is put up for sale. Following the committee's recommendation at stage one and Mr Rumble's amendment one, I intend that the overarching principles for disposals shall be set out in the Scottish forestry strategy with information, further information in forestry and land Scotland's framework document and corporate plan. This is similar to Forest Enterprise Scotland's existing corporate documentation. As the forestry strategy and the new agency's corporate plan will be subject to public consultation, I believe that this should 
provide sufficient reassurance that there will be appropriate scrutiny of the government's intentions on disposals. Um, in addition to, to those points, uh, convener, I'm concerned that the amendments, both amendments would unreasonably or artificially constrain the Scottish Government's ability and scope to make judgments about the overall management of the nation's public finances, judgments which are rightly subject to parliamentary scrutiny on a regular basis. In a widely recognised approach to the management of government budgets, it is appropriate to retain the flexibility to deploy surpluses for other priorities, just as it may be necessary to allocate budget from elsewhere if the agency were subject to unpredicted financial pressures. So it, it works both ways. Uh, but that flexibility, I would submit to convener, uh, is, is the key. I would therefore ask Mr Finney and Mr Green not to press these, these um, um, uh, amendments. We turn now to compulsory purchase powers. And uh, I want to, to state again, convener, that there is absolutely nothing unusual in having these powers. CPO is part of the statutory landscape in Scotland and indeed in Britain. Uh, powers are held by a number of public bodies for a variety of purposes. In fact, due to the diligence of my officials, I know of 20 Acts of Parliament that include the powers in Scotland. Of these, I note that uh, around one half were actually passed by uh, a Conservative administration. And I have here a little list um, which includes compulsory purchase powers that were set out by um, Conservative administrations under Mrs Thatcher and Mr Major, not, not noted land reform campaigners, so far as I recall. Uh, in the Crofter Scotland Act 1993, the Education Scotland Act 1980, the Electricity Act 1989, the Enterprise and New Towns Act 1990, the Housing Scotland Act 87, the Housing Associations Act 85, and the Environment Act 1995. I may have missed out a few, if so I apologise for that infelicity. But the point I'm making is a serious one, that the creation of these powers is a routine, uh, ordinary, work-a-day aspect in the, in the establishment of legislation. Uh, it is no more than that. Uh, and uh, I think uh, members will recall the evidence that was given, I believe, by Simon Hodge at stage one, that, that these powers in, the, in respect of forestry convener were set out in the 1967 Act, and over the ensuing 50 years, they have been used on zero occasions. So um, I, I know that the controversy is not in relation to forestry, but the land management issue, but I would suggest that, that, the, that the, the arguments that I've set out, that this is a routine matter, uh, routinely deployed by governments of all hues and nature, and it should be seen as that, uh, rather than uh, any desire on my part uh, to, to start to act in a dictatorial fashion, I can assure you I've no intention of that, and I can't imagine that that would be part of any ministerial actions. It may be helpful if I set out the scope of the proposed power. Section 16.1b, as read with Section 13, provides that Scottish ministers may compulsorily acquire land that they require to exercise their duty to manage land for the purpose of furthering the achievement of sustainable development. Government Amendment 38 has clarified that the land referred to includes land in the National Forest Estate, which is not forested as well as other non-forested land which Scottish ministers have acquired or otherwise agreed to manage under the powers of this bill. The proposed section 16.1b power does not give ministers powers to compulsorily purchase land to address issues of sustainable land management where there is no connection to land already managed under the duty at section 13 of the bill. And this is an important point. Ministers will only be able to use the proposed power to purchase land when that land is required for ministers to exercise an existing land management function under this bill. So I've set out the technicalities to indicate that the, the provisions, the precise wording of the powers are set out to constrain the potential exercise of the power in an appropriate fashion. This power has been provided to support the new duties placed on ministers by section 13 of this bill to manage non-forested land for the purpose of furthering the achievement of sustainable development. Around one third of the National Forest Estate is non-forested land and will be managed under the Section 13 duty. The duties being placed on ministers in relation to this land are new, and it is prudent, I believe, to take a CPO power that can support ministers to fulfil this duty for precisely the same reasons that I think committee members accepted 
it's appropriate to have the power in respect of forest land, namely a, the, the power exists as a backstop to ensure that negotiations over, for example, a ransom strip can successfully be brought to a conclusion. Now, I remember Mr Mason uh, at a previous stage making this very point in justification of the, uh, of the uh, uh, conferral of these powers. So, non-forest land in the estate is diverse and includes bogs, open mountain and farmland. Managing this land to further sustainable development will require ministers to consider a range of social, economic and environmental outcomes. It's not possible to say here what exactly those may be, convener, and how that may affect any particular piece of land. There may be issues with access to a site, management of a particular ecosystem, or unlocking a piece of land's economic potential. It is prudent to retain a power which can support the specific duty, as I've set out, relates to land in respect of which Scottish ministers will be exercising land management duties. It is not intended to allow ministers to intervene in other situations. It's also important to recognise the robust processes to which compulsory purchase powers are subject. The procedure for using the majority of CP powers is in the Acquisition of Land Authorisation Procedure Scotland Act of 1947. The bill provides for the use of this procedure for both of the Section 16 compulsory purchase powers. And this ensures that the process under the bill follows that for other compulsory purchase powers. The exercise of compulsory purchase requires public notice of the intent to purchase and notices to be made to owners, lessees and occupiers. There is accordingly the opportunity for objections to be made. A local inquiry can be held if necessary, which will weigh the public benefit of the order against the private interests of those with an interest in land. Ultimately, a challenge can be made to the Court of Session. This is, therefore, a robust process that no acquiring authority, including Scottish Minister's convener, would ever embark upon lightly. On CPO more generally, we recognise the process itself can be improved and modernised. The Scottish Government is working on this separately in advance of legislation, including reviewing the current framework for preparing, confirming and implementing orders. We are drafting updated guidance for acquiring authorities and will be preparing updated and improved guidance for landowners to improve transparency and confidence in the existing system. In the light of the points I've made about the scope of the power and the robustness of the compulsory purchase process, I would ask, uh, respectfully ask Mr Chapman to consider withdrawing his... Yes, I, yes, I will. Uh, is the Cabinet Secretary able to confirm that the trickle-down rules will continue to apply to uh, compulsory purchases made uh, under these headings, whereby if the land acquired by the government for a particular purpose is not used for that purpose, it must be returned to the original owner? Apparently the answer is yes. <laughs> so uh, I'm happy to, to provide that, uh, that confirmation. Um, I hope the additional information convener that I've pointed out in what has been, I'm afraid, a rather long contribution, uh, the additional information and the additional arguments and the setting out of the whole backdrop uh, and the checks and balances which exist uh, will allow members to, uh, uh, to reach the decision that the government can be supported in these matters. Um, turning to Amendment 40 in my name that clarifies that the powers of compulsory purchase in the Bill in include the power to acquire rights and interests in and over land. This flexibility enables rights to be taken that fall short of outright ownership of the land, for example, a servitude right of vehicular access. This allows the creation of new rights and interests so far as reliance on an existing right or interest may not be sufficient in the circumstances. There is precedent in enabling acts for this approach, for example, in the Roads Scotland Act 1984. The exercise of the power to acquire rights or interests compulsorily is subject to the same high tests as using it to gain ownership. In conclusion, the scenario of landlocked timber is familiar to the committee and backstop powers of compulsory purchase have been recognised as a valid tool in the box. Amendment 40, convener, adds to the toolbox by providing an additional option to outright purchase. Thank you for your forbearance. 
Thank you. I now call on John Finney to speak to Amendment 12 and any other amendments in the group he wishes to. Uh, thank you, Convener. I will speak to Amendment 12. Um, and it's in Section 17, the power to dispose of land. Um, and it's very simple, and that is that fa funds raised by disposals from the National Forest Estate should be reinvested in the National Forest Estate. Now, between 1999 and 2016, <coughs> the repositioning programme of the National Forest Estate covering acquisitions and disposals yielded a net profit of £59.3 million. 59.3 million. And this amendment would ensure that profits from disposals from the National Forest Estate should be reinvested on behalf of the people of Scotland in securing sustainable management of the National Forest Estate, potential to create new native woodland, acquiring additional outstanding examples of forests and woodland in Scotland, and importantly, to secure them for posterity. It's important to say this amendment is entirely in line with the, our own committee's recommendation in the Stage 1 report. <coughs> And that was that income generated from disposals should be reinvested in the National Forest Estate. And I think it's appropriate, therefore, that it be included, um, uh, this commitment, by the Government on the face of the bill. Now, I, I've heard what the Cabinet Secretary has said in relation to this, and uh, um, I, I'm not anticipating that there's going to be an agreement on it. And uh, I nonetheless will continue to engage on the issue. But given that it was in our report, I would wish to, to press the, the issue today. Um, and what I would be hoping to see is, is a com commitment for maybe um, matters to be included in the forest strategy, including details of the repositioning programme, so that uh, they could be included in the consultation of the strategy and importantly be scrutinised by the Parliament. And in relation to the compulsory purchase orders, um, I wasn't as animated as everyone else seemed to be on this issue. I think there are appropriate checks and balances in place. I'm relaxed that they continue to uh, apply and relaxed that they apply to sustainable uh, development. The argument they're not used is exactly the, the argument in the, the range of options that are available. Um, I am familiar with a very high profile, as I know the Cabinet Secretary and others around the table, will be in the highlands of a, a, a significant um, um, benefit to the public being held back by a ransom strip. Now, fortunately, negotiations meant that that didn't uh, have to, to uh, be utilised, but the, the public good must be at the forefront. I think that there are appropriate checks and balances, so I, I will be supporting uh, the continued position regarding that from the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> uh, now I call on Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 12A and any other amendments in the group he wishes to. Thank you, Convener. Uh, following on from uh, John Finney's comments on Amendment 12, I think there's much uh, to agree with in, in that, uh, in, in the sense that the uh, revenues generated from the sale of land should be uh, used uh, for specific forestry functions. M my view on this is quite simple, and that the uh, size of the forestry state should not diminish in any way. Uh, my nervousness is that uh, the uh, revenues achieved from the sale of land may be used to fill any potential shortfalls in, in budgets or, uh, or, or funds in, uh, in the functions of this new division. Uh, in essence, uh, that the sale of the revenue generated from the sale of land should be used for the purchase of land for the planting of trees. Uh, and then by doing so, would ensure that the size of our forestry state in Scotland does not diminish in any way. And that's why I feel I'd like to press further than John Finney's amendment by uh, proposing that uh, uh, capital achieved from the sale of land is used for the purchase of land. Um, moving on to some of the other um, amendments in this grouping, <clears throat> just to clarify, Peter Chapman's amendments in 39.6 and 42, uh, the Cabinet Secretary pointed out in great detail uh, the uh, uh, compulsory purchase powers which um, uh, other government governments and other jurisdictions have proposed and indeed uh, it's worth clarifying at this point that we don't uh, have any argument with that. Um, we in fact support the rollover of compulsory purchase powers from the 67 Act. Uh, my understanding is uh, that Mr Chapman's amendments um, uh, agree that the uh, compulsory purchase powers should be retained for the duties in section 9 of the bill but not 13. <laughs> And the reason for that is that is also my understanding that as a committee we took a, um, a view in the stage one report that we were happy 
by majority as a committee to roll over the compulsory purchase powers for the purposes of section 9 but not 13 and therefore Mr Chapman's amendment simply reflects the views that were expressed in the stage 1 report and I would hope therefore that other members of the committee would uh, um, maintain the, the views that we agreed on in the stage 1 report and, uh, and hope that they would vote for Mr Chapman's amendments because they simply reflect the report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now I've got a selection of members to speak. To. The first one is Stuart. Thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, let me just address some of uh, uh, Mr. Rumble's remarks about uh, the decisions we made at stage one. Um, he, he seems to suggest that instructions uh, inform uh, what SNP members uh, underdo in this committee. The fact that we voted in different sides of the argument in stage one is perhaps the evidence to the contrary. Uh, but of course, he who uh, never <laughs> Uh, changes their mind is unlikely to ever change anything. Uh, so the constructive discussions I've personally had with my colleagues, we will see the results of shortly. I can't predict uh, entirely uh, what they might be. I, I would make the comment uh, when my granny died, I was minus 13 years old. She only ever said one political thing in her entire life, I was, I was told, and that was never trust the Tories. And on the subject of land, I adhere to that absolutely. Oh, Convener. Right. I'm, I'm not sure that was a great anecdote to, to trot out, but Richard, you were, you were next. Well, I, I'll tell you something. Well, it's probably wouldn't be as bad as that, Stuart. And I have to agree with Stuart. I actually, uh, him and I were on separate sides of the fence in the la last time we were discussing this, but, you know, this morning I have recorded that I intend to press this government to plant more trees and to do as much as possible. And I intend to stick to that. And when I hear Mr Chapman continually vilifying the, 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 the Cabinet Secretary about the reason why he hasn't planted more trees and then now wants to tie his hand behind his back in regards to compulsory purchase, I'm appalled. And that's the, the word that I would use. I'm appalled because that is not... It's, it's inconsistent, it's not... You want an intervention, Mr Green? Carry on. Are, are you prepared to... to Mr. I, Green? I'll accept your intervention, then could I'll come do, back on. Could, could I ask you to do it through the, through the uh, chair? Look sorry. at me and, and I, I will bring... No, well, he, he, didn't, Jamie. he didn't clarify whether he was wanting to intervene or not. Jamie. Thank, thank, thank you, Convener, and thank you, Mr Law, for taking my intervention. Uh, as I said, Mr Chairman's amendment uh, would like to pursue the rollover of compulsory purchase powers for the uh, purposes of Section 9, which is management of forestry land, which uh, I think includes planting. And I think there's broad agreement that we would like to see more planting, not making any political points. I think there's consensus on that issue. Uh, the only thing Mr Chapman's amendment does is uh, exclude uh, Section 13, which is about the management of land to further sustainable development, which is not about planting. Uh, I, I thank you for the intervention, but as far as I'm concerned, I, I want to see this government doing more, planting more, and I, for one, won't tie their hands behind their back to do it. I intend to ensure that they do do it. And I, I'm sure members who have turned consistently and said they want them to do it should be doing the same as I. So, thank you, convener. Thank, thank you, Ms. Lyle. Uh, Claudia, did you want to, to come in? No, okay. Rhoda wants to come in and... Yep, right. Just extremely briefly, um, and just to say that I will be voting against Peter Chapman's amendments. I think it's important to have compulsory purchase in this bill for sustainable development, and it keeps it in line with other legislation, so I think it is right. But I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's comments about reviewing compulsory purchase. I also support John Finney's amendment because I think it's really important to to protect the finance from sale of forestry and the like to be reinvested in forestry. I've got some sympathy for Jamie Green's amendment as well, which takes it a bit further. I'm slightly afraid that might take it a bit too far in that things that, that um, I suppose, support sustainable forestry may, may then not be funded. And if there is a shortfall in the finance to do that, it could hold forestry back. So that's my, my one concern. But maybe if he would look to address that at some point, that would be useful. Um, Peter. Thank you, uh, convener. I, I uh, take some umbrage to uh, Richard Lyle's comments about how I would be 
trying to tie the, the, the cabinet secretary's hands. No, nobody's suggesting we tie the cabinet secretary's hands in any way, shape or form, in my opinion. I, I do want to see more trees planted, and I've always said so. But the, the, we're, we're not saying that there will be no compulsory purchase powers. We are quite content, I am quite content to roll over the powers that are in the 67 Act, and I, I made that clear as well. What I object to is the widening of, widening of the powers when there has been no attempt made to justify why there's any need to widen the powers to, to cover sustainable development. And I think that that is a step too far. I don't think it is necessary, and considering the fact that the, the Cabinet Secretary he confirmed that in the 50 years he's had the power, he's never used them. Why on earth does he think he needs any more powers? And that is my point. So as far as I'm concerned, the 67 powers can remain, but the widening of the powers to, con to in include sustainable development are not necessary and have, haven't been proved to be necessary, and therefore I object to, to them being there. And that is what my amendments uh, the 6, 39 and 42 are all about. Thank you, Peter. Go. Yeah, um, there's been a lot of reference to the Stage 1 report. Can I just point out, in um, Recommendation 104, uh, we say that the majority of the committee is of the view that the Scottish Government is yet to provide sufficient justification for the proposed extension of compulsory purchase powers to cover sustainable development. Um, I would actually put forward that given what the Cabinet Secretary has said to the committee today at stage two, that indeed he has provided sufficient justification for the extension of the powers and that was what the committee had asked for. Thank you. Is there any other member like to say anything? Right. Uh, I'm now going to bring myself in. Uh, I've chosen at two stages of this uh, session to bring myself in. This is the first one. Uh, first of all, I would say that as far as Amendment 12A is concerned, put forward by Jamie Green, I actually support that amendment because my concern is that we don't want to see the diminution of the size of the forest estate. I think the people of Scotland expect to see the forest estate growing in size and therefore taking money out of the forest estate by selling land and using it to fund general running costs of the new body, I believe is fundamentally wrong. So therefore I would like to see the money roll forward and indeed that is my understanding of the <coughs> Parliament's policy when it decided to allow the repositioning of the forest estate to take money out of the sales and put it back into purchasing the estate. And I believe that this gives the very surety that people need to look at forestry because forestry is a rolling aspect, i.e. that you, you p purchase land, if necessary, without trees and put trees on it. Once the trees are there and you have the safeguards in place to ensure that the trees remain there, then it is perfectly right that the Forestry Commission looked to selling that bit and moving on to the next bit, which will gradually increase the whole forest estate and forestry in Scotland. Therefore, I think that Jamie Green's Amendment 12A does in just that policy. As far as the uh, compulsory purchase powers, first of all, I, I note the Cabinet Secretary's uh, amendments, uh, comments about previous legislation. They, they make me smile in the sense that we're now in 2017 and a lot of the legislation that he, he mentioned was way before the time I became involved in politics. But looking at the fact we're now in 2017, and I'd like to declare that as a surveyor, I've actually been involved in compulsory purchase powers and, and, and have some knowledge of them. And I should also declare that I have an interest in a farm for those that, that consider that important. I don't think it is here in relation to this. But the compulsory purchase powers are deeply flawed at the moment as they are structured. And I don't believe that they work very well and they need to be completely reformed to make them fit for 2017. I also believe that the, as the compulsory purchase powers for forestry have never been used since the 1967 Act came in, they're not actually that much of a threat. There was a lot made of the fact that they've been threatened to be used. I've never any, had any evidence. And when we pushed the officials that came in, they said that there might be one or two occasions they could have been used as a threat. But there was no clear evidence to me that they were used as a threat. And a threat in, in this particular case 
doesn't particularly work because the ransom strip that the Cabinet Secretary said that he wanted to avoid using, still, if you go by the, the Acquisition of Land Act, has to be compensated at the value that the ransom strip is there. All you're doing is saying that you want it, but you have to agree the value. And according to the definition of open market value, which is what an acquisition is placed on, there is a value to a ransom strip, and that has to be taken into account. So I don't really support... Uh, the 67 roll forward position, uh, provisions into this Forestry Act, but I can see why it gives the Cabinet Secretary some confidence, which is why, as an individual, I'm happy to see it in relation to forestry. In relation to other land, I don't actually see that it benefits at all. Uh, the other land that the Forestry Commission have, the one-third of it a state that isn't forested, that is not going to be benefited by these compulsory powers. I don't see how, how that would work, because the management of that forestry land is done in accordance with the forest estate. So I really don't see that there is much requirement for it. So I personally won't be voting in favour of that. Um, that is my position on it. I now withdraw from the debate, having done that, and put my convener's hat back on. And I notice that Claudia wants to come in uh, briefly, if I may ask you to do that, so I can pass it back to the Cabinet Secretary very briefly, if you'd like yeah, to Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, it was simply to um, reinforce the point that uh, I, I do um, take the view that the Cabinet Secretary has indeed clarified um, the need for... Um, uh, management of land to further the achievement of sustainable development and um, in the list that he gave uh, just earlier in this in this grouping and also there are there are other areas such as agroforestry where the definition may um, fall more into sustainable development than actual strict forestry um, definitions and I think it's very important that we keep the sustainable <coughs> development opportunity. Um. Cabinet Secretary, you have already spoken, but if you'd like to come back briefly on any of the points that have been raised, I, I'm happy to, to let you in briefly. Uh, no, I've enjoyed listening to the debate, and uh, I had my opportunity earlier when I set out the points in the way that I wished. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I would call on then Mike Rumbles to, to wind up and press or withdraw his amendment. Um, the Minister eloquently outlined a number of acts over the years which have conferred compulsory purchase powers. He said that parliaments have routinely given the powers to government. And we already know all of this, but it's good to be reminded of the fact because, colleagues, I would say that is exactly my point. The government has enough compulsory powers already, and we already know it. It doesn't need any more. The 1967 powers have never been used, as we all recognised. Ministers of all parties always say that they would never want to gather in further unnecessary powers. These are unnecessary powers. And I don't focus on our current minister, he's an honourable man, but even he will accept that he will not be minister forever. <laughs> in principle, and this is about the principle of parliament versus government, in principle it is not a good thing a parliament to give unnecessary executive powers to ministers. Over the years, I've always asked ministers of different parties, whose civil servants, by the way, always want them to have unnecessary powers. They normally say that they simply want to future-proof the legislation. Who knows how things are going to change? We need these powers to future-proof. Well, the government's future-proofing should be parliament's wariness. Um, Stuart Stevenson said that I had said that some members of the committee had received instructions or implied they received instructions as to how to vote on this issue from the government. I would never say this. I said, and I repeat what I said for the avoidance of doubt, that I said some members of the committee had received guidance as to how to vote. Now, there is a great deal of difference between instructions and guidance. The government is perfectly entitled to issue guidance to MSPs of their choice. It's, it's MSPs' choice as to what they do with that guidance. And it's up to individual members around this committee table to decide for themselves, and they must live with the decisions they make. I said it's up to colleagues on the committee to vote the way they wish to vote. As to the evidence on this subject, I was a bit shocked to say that there's been new evidence. I have seen nothing. Nothing has changed in the evidence. I haven't seen any new evidence brought to us by the minister 
that in my view should affect our decision in stage one. But I am a realist, if nothing else. I know what the numbers amount to. It is disappointing to realize that our recommendations in our stage one report, which were good, are not accepted by everybody in the committee. I accept that. People have different views. Of course they do. But it was a genuine compromise and it was a genuine attempt to do the right thing between parliament and government. And I put this down to the government guidance that has been received by some members. And I repeat the point. It is guidance, but it's up to every individual MSP to decide what they should do. So can I ask you to I will press, move press or withdraw two. your amendment? Move amendment two. Okay, so we then come to the question, is that amendment two be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Okay. That is agreed then. I call amendment 22 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with amendment 18. Cabinet Secretary to move formally that amendment. Not, not moved. Not moved. Thank you. Okay, because of the length that it has taken to this stage of the morning, I'm proposing a five minute suspension of business uh, to allow members a comfort break. So the, mem the meeting is suspended five minutes.
Thank you. I now reconvene the meeting and I'd move, like to move on to the next group in which is delegation to community bodies. I'd like to call amendment 23 in the name of Richard Lyle, group with amendments 43, 132, 44, 45 and 110. Richard Lyle, please, can you move amendment 23 and speak yes. to all the amendments in the group? Yeah, thank you, convener. I move uh, amendment 23 and all other amendments uh, and speak to all other amendments in the group. During stage one, the committee heard evidence from a number of stakeholders that the provisions in the bill relating to delegation of land management functions to community bodies, set in particular sections 18, 19 and 20, were at best unnecessary and at worst introduced additional complexity and bureaucracy for the very groups that were seeking to get involved in land management. This view was expressed in the context of the commencement in January this year of Part 5 of the Community Empowerment Scotland 2015 Act, which deals with asset transfer. We also heard concerns that the definition of community body used in the Bill was different from that in other community empowerment legislation, notably the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015, potentially causing confusion. The Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy assured the committee during his stage one, stage one evidence that officials were aware of and looking into the potential overlap between the Bill and asset transfer legislation. In the Scottish Government response to the Committee Stage 1 report published on November 3rd, the Cabinet Secretary confirmed that officials were considering the matter with a view to bringing forward any necessary amendments at Stage 2. In the event we have not seen any amendments from the Government, I refer the Cabinet Secretary to the views of key stakeholders in this area, who advise that these provisions are unnecessary and should be reviewed from the Bill, removed from the Bill, I consider that stakeholders are right and my amendments seek to remove the relevant sections from the Bill. Existing legislation, namely Asset Transfer under Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015, delivers the necessary outcomes for communities. Members should then also note that my amendment 44 seeks to remove section 19 and therefore makes Jamie Green's amendment 132, which seeks to amend it, unnecessary. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Green, I ask you to speak to Amendment 132 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. <clears throat> um, as Richard Lyle just pointed out, um, the removal of sections 18, 19 and indeed 20 would negate the need uh, for my amendment. However, um, I have to say uh, we uh, have given some careful thought to this. Um, I, uh, I was a little bit surprised um, to see these amendments, which are small in wording but uh, huge in effect. They take out in effect all references to um, community bodies from the bill and I'm, I guess uh, in the, the, the statement that Mr. Lal has given, he mentioned around the ambiguity around what the definition of a community body is. My amendment actually seeks to achieve that and that's to strengthen the definition of a community body by saying that it is the same as that in the community empowerment Act 2015, and by providing that clarity, therefore, would uh, strengthen that whole uh, that whole section of the bill, sections 18, 19, 20. I'm yet to be uh, convinced or persuaded as to why we should support the removal of these sections, and I'm very keen to hear more, perhaps, over the course of this uh, debate uh, and these these groupings. Um, uh, so, for that reason, I'm minded to <coughs> maintain that my amendment. Um, it strengthens the definition of community body. I hope other members would accept that um, and listen with great interest as to uh, why these sections should be removed. Thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, would you, would you like to say something on this matter? Um, I thank Richard Lyle for lodging amendments 23, 43, 44 and 5 and 110 and I'm content to support them. In consequence, uh, I don't support Mr Green's Amendment 132, and I think he understands that it's negated uh, if, if uh, Mr Lyle's amendments are accepted by the committee. I also thank the members of the Rural uh, Economy and Connectivity and the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committees and many stakeholders for their scrutiny of this part and, and insightful suggestions for improvement. I did signal to the committee during Stage 1 that officials were considering the provisions in the Bill on Delegation of Land Management Functions to Community Bodies, and specifically 
convener, how they interact with the existing community empowerment law. I've concluded that the provisions in the bill duplicate and do not enhance law elsewhere on community empowerment. Further, I agree with the points made during stage one evidence by the Community Woodlands Association that there is a risk that their existence may complicate unnecessarily the landscape for delivery of community empowerment objectives, including for community bodies themselves. I'm content that the asset transfer regime under part five of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015 can be relied upon to deliver the policy objectives behind sections 18, 19 and 20 of the bill and that these sections can be removed. I note that a wide range of stakeholders, including the aforementioned Community Woodlands Association and Community Land Scotland recommended this course of action and that it is supported by the forestry sector, including Scottish land and estates. I note the intention behind Amendment 132, which is to deliver better integration between the bill and the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015. As I've indicated, I'm sympathetic to this outcome, but consider it can best be achieved through removing sections 18, 19 and 20 altogether, rather than through their retention and amendment. Uh, for this reason, I don't support Amendment 132. Convener, there is a strong track record of community involvement in managing forestry, and I wish to see that continue as we complete devolution. In January this year, Forest Enterprise Scotland launched the new Community Asset Transfer Scheme, or CATS, implementing Part 5 of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015. This builds on the highly successful National Forest Land Scheme, which predated the statutory asset transfer regime, and which delivered 42 sales, totalling 17,000 acres. This included 31 sales to communities, totalling over 10,000 acres. The first successful request under CATS was announced last month, and a further 20 requests are in the pipeline. It's encouraging that the Scottish Government's policies are, therefore, giving people more control over decisions that affect them and enabling communities to shape their individual and collective futures. I therefore support the amendments in the name of Richard Lyle. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I therefore call on Richard Lyle to wind up and press or withdraw his amendment. I think it was short. I think most of the comments that I were actually going to make, the Cabinet Secretary has just made. Um, and therefore, I ask uh, members uh, uh, to support my amendment and tend to press my <coughs> amendment uh, in the group. Thank you. Therefore, we'll move to the question is that Amendment 33 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Sorry, 23, sorry. I'll repeat that. So the question is that Amendment 23 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, we are agreed. The, that is, the question is that Section 6 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I'm now going to call Amendment 10 in the name of Peter Chapman, already debated with Amendment 9. Peter Chapman to move or not move? Uh, move. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. Okay, we are not agreed, therefore I call a division. Those in favour of the amendment, please raise their hands. Yep. Those against the amendment, please raise their hands. And any abstentions? No. Sorry. Now we've got the maths right. Total, total votes for the amendment, four votes against, seven. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 130 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 9. John Finney to move or not move? Move, convener. Thank you. Therefore, the question is, Amendment 130 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. Okay, we're not agreed. Therefore, there's a division. Uh, please, can I have those in favour of the amendment to raise their hands, please? Those against, those who abstain. So the voting is seven in favour of the amendment, three against, one abstention. The motion therefore is agreed. We now move on to the next grouping, which is the involvement of persons with an interest in forestry. I'd like to call Amendment 129 in the name of Claudia Beamish in a group on its own. Claudia Beamish, uh, would you Thank like to move and speak to your amendment, please? Thank you, Convener, and I move the amendment in my name. This amendment aims to preserve the involvement and inclusion of those on the ground in forestry and land management. 
It will, uh, would follow from section six, duty to have regard to forest, forestry strategy and ensures those with an interest in forestry are involved in the delivering and acting out of the functions of this bill by ministers. This amendment would create a requirement to involve people with knowledge of securing sustainable economic benefits, sustainable forest management, silviculture, land management, environmental and biodiversity issues. It also requires consultation with persons and representative organisations, I would um, point out, such as unions. Again, this amendment demonstrates the scope of social, environmental and economic functions delivered by the Forestry Commission and is designed to ensure that each of these six areas, each vital tenets of forestry management, are taken into consideration. <coughs> Scotland has some exceptional, exceptionally knowledgeable and experienced people in its forestry sector, as we all, I'm sure, agree. And my amendment 129 enshrines their inclusion in forestry policy, regardless of the new arrangements for forestry um, organisations after its devolution. And I therefore um, ask members to consider um, supporting this amendment, which would put these um, issues on the face of the bill. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Claudia. Um, Stuart, you wanted to enter. Uh, I've, I've got a technical issue with the way it's cast, which I, I would address. Um, take steps to ensure that such arrangements involve. I've really no idea what involve means in this context. Uh, does it mean we need someone under each of these headings to be on a board of some kind related to this? Or does it simply mean that uh, the minister has to have, have them in for dinner and listen to them uh, once every 50 years? Or is it something in between that? I'm just very uncertain uh, what it might mean. Um, I repeat my uh, regular uh, rail against the use of lists because, and, and indeed Claudia herself uh, mentioned unions when unions per se do not appear in the list while I recognise there will be unions who have the expertise that she's looking for. I, I, I guess we'll hear from the Cabinet Secretary uh, once again the difficulties for governments in identifying people with experience and knowledge of and by excluding people of, uh, sorry, experience or knowledge of, it strictly says. Convener. Thank you. Uh, Jamie. Thank you, Convener. I'd like to follow on from Stuart Stevenson's comments and I think it harks back to the earlier comments made by the Cabinet Secretary um, uh, around ambiguity over interpretation of how you de define a person with experience in or knowledge of. It is incredibly difficult to do so. Um, there are also other vague terms in this amendment, such as a consultation with persons who have an interest in. Uh, lots of people have interest in, but again, how do you define that? And Stuart Stevenson's point around involvement of what is involvement. Um, and I think in any a, a, a way, this may even uh, restrict the minister and his ability to discharge uh, his duties under the Act. So for that reason, I'd be unable to support the amendment. Thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I thank Claudia Bewish for this, this amendment, and I fully recognise the importance of ensuring that those with the right professional skills, knowledge and experience are engaged in the development and delivery of forestry in Scotland. Um, but I'm, I'm not persuaded that this amendment would necessarily deliver that outcome. I believe that the bill already includes convener suitable provision for how ministers must discharge their functions. Uh, uh, and these are set out in part in section six, uh, which says how ministers must discharge their functions under the bill. And section six requires ministers to have regard to the forestry strategy when exercising their forestry functions. And amendment 129 overlaps, I think, with this requirement. Further, whilst the bill is mainly about management of forestry, it also covers management of land for sustainable development, a matter not recognised in this amendment. As drafted, the amendment would result in a requirement for wide consultation on all of the activities covered by this bill. This includes wider land management role for ministers to manage non-forested land and the more mundane regulatory activity for forestry. In neither scenario would the effect of the amendment be practical or appropriate. But I am clear that it is vital to maintain professional expertise and skills as we complete forestry devolution. And I'm grateful actually to have an opportunity just to make that absolutely clear for all of those uh, uh, listening or, or observing uh, the record in future. Um, I have previously stated that within the new structures for forestry, 
I wish to expand on the existing skills development mechanisms within Forestry Commission Scotland and Forest Enterprise Scotland and to continue to involve foresters and other professionals in the discharge of the Scottish Government's forestry uh, functions. Um, it is, I'm sure, an unintended omission, but there's no reference in the amendment to those involving uh, with experience in our knowledge of community ownership involvement with forestry. Um, and I point this out to highlight the inherent risks of including an exclusive list within legislation. It cannot be comprehensive as some stakeholders, such as CONFOR, have noted, uh, and it may date um, the, the bill. I would uh, support the arguments that Mr Stevenson and Mr Green have made about the technicalities, and I also think that use of the word arrangements is vague because it's not clear really what these arrangements would be, when they would be, how they could be uh, discharged. Um, so, I, but these are technical points. I, I do share the sentiments of, uh, uh, or, or which have been expressed. Uh, but I would ask members to resist Amendment 129 on the basis that it is unnecessary and unnecessarily restrictive. Thank you, Cabinet <coughs> Secretary. Claudia Bemis, I'd ask you to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I, I've listened carefully to the discussions and um, <coughs> take on board the points made by Stuart Stevenson about a definition of involve. We don't want to get too tied up in definitions, but I do take that point. Um, and also Jamie Green's point um, about um, what is experience and knowledge of. Uh, this, this amendment did come from a range of groups who've approached me who have concerns about as we move forward to the devolved uh, arrangements that, uh, uh, that uh, to be open about it, that um, it won't be subsumed within Victoria Quay, that it will be um, out there in, uh, across Scotland um, and across the skills and the range of, of professions and uh, I do take the Cabinet Secretary's point as well about um, uh, the missing clause of, about community, uh, community ownership um, which having been involved with the Land Reform Act as it now is, is, is very important so that was indeed an omission. I think it was a, a probing amendment to a degree. It is very important um, to many stakeholders, and um, including unions, uh, that their interests are taken into account. And I do did, certainly didn't want to make something cumbersome, and that's the point that I take as well of the Cabinet Secretaries. Um, what, what is one obliged then to consult on, and, and how far would that go, and who indeed would one actually consult on, and that might become very cumbersome. So I, I will um, withdraw the amendment. Uh, on the understanding, if I've got it right, that the Cabinet Secretary has put on the record the importance of, of um, the range of skills and professions and organisations that should be involved in moving forward a positive and sustainable forest uh, strategy in the context of, of the new devolved powers. So I, I will not be putting forward my amendment. Okay, th therefore I have a question. Does any other member present object to the amendment being withdrawn? No. Okay, so therefore the next question is that sections 7 and 8 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, we then move forward to the next grouping, which is coordination, cooperation, implant health responsibilities. <coughs> I'm going to call amendment 131 in the name of Jamie Green in a group on its own. Jamie Green to move and speak to the, to the amendment, please. Thank you, Convener. I'd like to speak to uh, Amendment 131 concerning uh, the duty on ministers to coordinate and cooperate in plan health responsibilities. Uh, it is my view that given the cross-border nature of uh, plant health on an island, uh, uh, there should be additional wording in the bill which reflects that and places additional duty on the minister to take that into account. Uh, under whilst understanding that uh, it, it, this bill cannot um, mandate the uh, Scottish Minister to uh, ensure that a memorandum or any memorandum of understanding would be uh, in, indeed agreed or signed by Secretaries of State or Ministers of other uh, parliaments. Uh, I would like to see some uh, wording agreed that ensures that they take reasonable steps to try and achieve an MOU of such and indeed would set before Parliament a report 
that they have taken reasonable steps to achieve uh, Section 1 of Amendment 131 and also update Parliament as to any arrangements or agreements that result from such a memorandum of understanding. I hope the Cabinet Secretary will find this a constructive addition to the Bill. Um, and uh, my understanding is that without uh, putting it in legislation, there, uh, of course, is no uh, mandate for the Minister to do so, and I hope that will be taken into account. I therefore push uh, and move my amendment in that respect. Thank you. Uh, Stuart. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, just again, looking at the words that are in the Jamie Green's amendment, it must take all reasonable steps to ensure that they agree. I just don't see that we can ensure that they will agree. So I think the, the, the wording that is uh, before us um, is not capable of assuredly being delivered. And on that basis, I don't think I can support it. Mike. Yes, again, I would wish to disagree with my esteemed colleague, Stuart Stevenson, because he, he focused on the word to ensure. That is not the purpose of this amendment. The purpose of the amendment is to take all reasonable steps. All reasonable steps. Who could possibly object to that? Um, so, really, the emphasis to say that we're focusing on the word ensure is erroneous. What this amendment is doing is it's simply saying to Scottish ministers to take all reasonable steps and that way, therefore, I will support the amendment from Jamie Green. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Um, I announced on day one of stage, or on the day of the stage one debate, rather, that agreement had been reached with my counterparts in the UK and Welsh governments on sharing responsibility for important cross-border forestry functions. Um, one government will coordinate delivery convener of each function on behalf of all three. Um, under that agreement, certain forestry plant health responsibilities that are primarily linked to trade will be led by the UK Government. That includes inspections at ports and airports for wood and wood products, maintaining a register of premises for forest products and timber, and regulation for identification and control of seeds and cuttings. Other tree health functions will continue to be carried out separately in each country. For example, surveys and monitoring for tree pests in Scotland will continue to be coordinated by Scotland. I mean, I, I would argue that that work, which uh, uh, was achieved after a great deal of positive interaction with the uh, UK government and with the Welsh devolved <coughs> administration, does perhaps constitute uh, reasonable steps. So, to reassure Mr. Rumbles, re reasonable steps have already been trodden, if, uh, if that is the way to put it. Whilst they have not resulted in a formal written agreement, there is an agreement in principle. And we expect that that agreement in principle will be taken forward um, a, to full agreement uh, prior to the law coming into force. Um, so I, I don't accept, actually, you know, that the current arrangements for cooperation are deficient. These arrangements are carried out in an extra parliamentary way between the Scottish Government and the other government bodies involved. Additionally, I don't believe the amendment properly reflects the fact that completing devolution of forestry is actually the, one of the principal drivers of this bill. Um, I would anticipate there always being close cooperation between administrations on these islands on matters such as plant health. Indeed, I've emphasised the importance of that, and also I know that many stakeholders are keen that that should be the case, and also keen to hear me say so, and that this message is delivered and understood and being acted upon between the Scottish Government and other governments in these islands. So I welcome the opportunity to reconfirm and restate that because those listening will, I think, welcome that fact. Plant and tree disease respects no borders. These are very, very serious matters. Tackling them effectively are one of the absolute essentials of sustainable forestry management. And on a cross-border basis, these matters can, I think, be most effectively tackled. Um, but there is a different point here because what Mr Green seeks to do, so far as I know, is unprecedented. That is to place in statute that we must somehow secure a memorandum of, under a memorandum of agreement with other bodies. There is no other statute, my legal adviser informs me, where that approach has been taken. And I think perhaps it, it would detract from devolution if our law seeks to fetter our scope in respect of devolved matters. I mean, forestry is a devolved issue, and the approach taken, I think, may serve to detract from 
the, um, the very nature of devolved power. But I can reassure Mr Green that arrangements are in place, as I say, to ensure cooperation on plant health. For example, we maintain a UK plant health risk register, which is reviewed monthly by the UK plant health risk group, and we take part in biannual UK plant health coordination meetings. We published the Scottish Plant Health Strategy in March 2016, which sets out measures to safeguard agriculture, horticulture, forestry, and the wider environment from pests and diseases over the period from 2016 to 2021. And I hope that this will reassure Mr Green and all members that this is consistent with the Plant Biosecurity Strategy for Great Britain, published in 2014, which was itself signed off by Scottish and other GB plant health ministers. So you see, Mr Green, we are a wee bit ahead of you, I'm very pleased to say. We have been doing all of this already. We will continue to do so, but not on the basis, I think, of something inserted in the face of Scottish Parliament legislation. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I call on Jamie Green to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment. Uh, thank you, Convener, and thank you to other members and the Cabinet Secretary for their feedback on the amendment. Uh, I think there are some, perhaps some contradictions in the Minister's response um, to the uh, comments I made. Uh, far from seeking to detract from uh, devolution, uh, I think uh, the Minister acknowledged uh, that uh, plant health has no borders uh, and in, in that respect and in that vein um, this is a, an important and necessary addition to the bill. Um, I, I understand that, that uh, very positive and constructive work has already been achieved with the various administrations um, but uh, uh, referring back to previous points we've made uh, by putting it in the bill this future proofs the concept. Now it's all very well that current administrations are in agreement orally uh, to take this issue seriously and work constructively together. But that, those are three existing administrations in their own uh, respective parliamentary cycles. Uh, I would like to ensure that this is future-proofed in the sense that regardless of who is running those administrations, uh, that that good work continues uh, beyond uh, the uh, term of the existing parliaments of which the three uh, mentioned administrations are involved in. So for that reason, I'm unswayed, uh, if you like, by the Cabinet Secretary's argument that good work has been done and achieved on this issue, and therefore we should let it rest at that. I would like to uh, continue with this amendment to ensure that future administrations take the issue of cross-border plant health seriously. I, as Mr Rumbles pointed out, uh, all this does is ask for Scottish ministers to take reasonable steps that in itself I do not think is an unreasonable request. So can I just ask you to formally press your, your amendment? I formally press the amendment, therefore. Okay. The question, therefore, is Amendment 131 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Okay. The, the, therefore, call a division. Those in favour? Those against? Okay, th those for the amendment are five, those against amendment are six. It's therefore not agreed. We're now going to move on to the next grouping, which is dear management, and I call amendment 11 in the name of John Finney in a group on its own. Mr Finney, could you move and speak to the amendment, <coughs> please? Uh, thank you, convener. Yes, uh, I move amendment uh, 11 in my name, which uh, is uh, section 8, duty of dear management to sure... Uh, sustainable forest management and the amendment um, proposes that's done by the insertion of the information you have in front of you into uh, the Dear Scotland Act 1996 as amended. Um, and it's important to give some background there. Uh, population modelling isn't an exact but it's uh, thought between 85 and 100,000 rows seek and fallow deer in private forests um, and uh, 40 to 50, 45,000 on the National Forest Estate. Red Deer estimates are 45 to 60,000 in private forests and 40 to 45,000 in the National Forest Estate. And 30% of all deer culling 
in Scotland is by the Forestry Commission. That costs the taxpayers £5 million per year. Now, uh, as was said earlier in our debate, uh, woodlands are deer habitats and new woodlands will create new deer habitats. Um, and it should be the responsibility of all owners of private forests to ensure arrangements to manage the deer that live in their forests and woodland. And that would be important not just for the future timber crop, but also for woodlands' uh, biodiversity value. It's also the, the question of impact the deer have on adjacent land, the damage to agricultural crops and the uh, increased risk of road traffic collisions. Um, so there's a legal requirement for all foreigners to protect the forest asset. And this amendment to incorporate a duty of deer management will ensure sustainable forest management. And this duty should be discharged by having a plan in place to manage deer, ensuring that arrangements are put in place to carry out that plan as well as reducing some of the damaging impacts that deer can have. Um, there's also a view that it will create uh, economic opportunities with the letting of deer stocking to qualified people and venison sales generating in income. Um, now, such arrangements already exist in some places, and this bill, would in, uh, the bill, if this amendment were accepted, would ensure suitable arrangements are in place for all woodlands, and it would help drive a step change, particularly with regard to the lowland deer management issue. Um, and um, it would be in line with the the Rural Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's report on the subject. So um, I move it in my name. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr Finney. Uh, Mike Rumbles. Yeah, I don't support the amendment on the grounds that we haven't taken any evidence on this. Um, we've, as I say, we've taken, I mentioned this in the previous amendment from Claudia Beamish, that we could have taken, if we wanted to go down this route, a good deal of evidence um, before us from... Um, landowners uh, and land occupiers because, uh, and we haven't done so. And I think to just put this in as an amendment, quite a substantial amendment, um, what I consider to be the last minute without us having to have people before the committee uh, is unhelpful. I mean, if you look at the actual wording of the, of the amendment, Scottish ministers must by regulations make provision requiring owners and occupiers of forest land to take such steps as may be specified in the regulations. Unspecified powers given over to ministers. Um, and then again, in subsection 5, the Scottish Parliament a draft Scot Scottish statutory instrument containing the first regulations under subsection 1. I'd like to ask how many statutory instruments have we rejected in this committee? Um, this is a legitimate question, and I can't think of any, because, of course, with statutory instruments, they are unamendable even. So our power as a committee, our power as a parliament is completely restricted by this. And I think it would be entirely wrong simply to put this at the last minute into the forestry bill. By all means, it's a legitimate subject and we need to, we need to have taken evidence on it. We haven't done so. We've decided not to go down that route and therefore I think it would be entirely wrong to support this at stage two, at uh, last minute like this. Thank you. Uh, Stuart Stevenson, followed by Peter Chapman. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Um, just picking up Mike Rumbles, have we rejected any? I'm not sure this committee has. I, I certainly have been involved in successfully uh, seeing an affirmative. At least, I, subject to my checking, it might have been a negative one. I, I can't quite remember. It was a long time ago. He's right in making the general point that it doesn't happen very often. It's not even challenged very often. But... Nonetheless, Parliament decides on SSIs just as it decides on primary legislation. So I don't, I don't think there's much distinction. However, turning to the substance of uh, what we have before us, I, I, I don't disagree in any way, shape or form uh, with uh, John Swinney about the need to manage deer uh, in forests. Sorry, can I, can I just confirm that? I think you mean John Finney. John I, Swinney what did not I say? Here. Oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> just for, for the record. Uh, John Swinney is in India and uh, John Finney is in front of me. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but, so, John, John Finney has tabled Amendment uh, 11 and I agree with the underlying principles. Um, my difficulty which I'm open to hearing more about, is that if one uh, manages only one part of the ecosystem and not the, what's going on in the neighbouring areas, the experience, I think, on deer management, where we've had estates taking different views who are adjacent on their deer management policies because they have different shooting policies that they're making money off, that all that happens is if you create a hole 
in the ecostructure where there are fewer deer, deer simply move in. So I think to, to separate off uh, forests from an overall strategy to manage deer populations, I would want to hear some of the arguments that really suggest that that would actually uh, be of assistance. Uh, so that's, that's simply my concern about this one, Convener. Peter Chapman, followed by Rich Law. And uh, I concur with both Mike Rumbles and uh, Stuart Stevenson in what they have already said. Uh, I, I am against this. I mean, we all know that deer management is an issue as far as, as, as trees are concerned, but there are, there are deer management arrangements in place. There are separate, separate rules and regulations that are well known. And, uh, you know, this bell is about trees. This bell isn't about deer. Um, so I, I don't see the need for this at all. I mean, one, one way to, to manage deer is, 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 not everybody likes it, but it's a, a fact of life, one way to manage deer is to fence the, fence the trees. You know, so there are other ways forward. So I don't think this is necessary. I think this is the wrong place. The, the, the uh, deer management uh, rules and regulations are well known and are already in place in other places, and it, and it has no place in this bill. Richard Love, followed by Red Grant. Yeah, well, unfortunately, John Finney's sitting beside me. So, but uh, even because of that, I, I, I'm sorry, John, I can't, I can't support uh, your amendment. And it's been put to me that forest owners could face penalties if they don't take up uh, measures to control deer. Uh, could we make landowners liable to new penalties for choosing to plant trees? Would tend to discourage other afforestation, discourage integrated land use by increasing disparity in regulation. And I believe it is in the interest of forest owners to control deer, but other measures, to use other measures to tackle deer numbers, and they should be cooperative rather than punitive. And I therefore can't support my good friend and colleague John Finney's amendment. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move to Rhoda Grant, followed by Claudia Beamish. I, I have sympathy for the amendment. Um, it probably isn't necessary for commercial forestry because to have a commercial forest, you would have to control deer. There would be no two ways about it. I suppose where I have more sympathy with the amendment is regarding native woodland, because if we do encourage native woodland at the moment, there are not many commercial uses for it. And it might be that people will plant native woodland in the thought that, you know, that's kind of aesthetically pleasing, but we'll leave it and not manage it properly. If we're really going to manage, cultivate and use native woodland, I think there has to be a degree of deer management. So um, I'm not quite sure if this is the place. I will listen with interest to what the Cabinet Secretary says and how he would propose that that would happen before I make up my mind on the amendment. Thank you. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Convener. And uh, I would just like to highlight again that, um, as I said, I think at the point of my own amendment, which was 123 on this issue of, of um, deer management, that uh, our committee did write in a letter to the um, the REC committee, to this committee where we're hearing the evidence today um, about concerns about deer management as we indeed did about biodiversity and a number of other matters. So it has been highlighted, although I do take the point that there hasn't been direct ev evidence taken by this committee. Um, I do think that um, John Finney put forward the arguments really clearly about um, how um, complex this issue is and how incredibly important it is in the context particularly of forestry because um, there are areas of Scotland where the deer management groups having been on the RACI committee and taken a lot of evidence on it previously um, in the last session of the parliament there are areas where deer management groups are not working satisfactorily and I think um, that uh, there, there could well be merit on having this, this <coughs> amendment Within, within the bill or something further at stage three which recognises the significance of the issue in relation to, um, to forestry, but taking up Rhoda Grant's important point also uh, more to woodland as well. Uh, so I, I, do, I do think, although I, I, will, I don't have a vote, I wanted to, to highlight that it is such a significant issue in relation to the future of our forestry, and I look forward to hearing the Cabinet Secretary's comments. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, Jamie Green, and then I'm going to come to the Cabinet Secretary. 
Thank you, Convener. Uh, just to add on uh, some further comments, uh, I think it's absolutely right and important to address this issue. Uh, as many members have uh, uh, stated today, I'm not convinced that this is the place to do it in this bill itself. Uh, the bill talks about uh, further regulations and penalties as a result of those regulations, but doesn't go into any great detail what those regulations may look like. I suspect, therefore, and I'm happy to be corrected, that that would come through secondary legislation. Um, and indeed, this additional amendment opens a, a quite a huge can of worms and, and the consequences of which I'm not convinced we've taken full account of. Um, also, uh, we've taken very limited evidence on the subject. We have had representation on the matter, and it is an important matter. But in order to add something as substantive as this amendment, I would have expected the committee to have taken far more evidence and uh, to, to reach a point to discuss it in its fullest and, and proper uh, terms, as it rightfully deserves. And I think, as a committee, it's something we should do. But I don't think inserting it in this bill at this stage is the right way to address the problem. Thank you, Jamie. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Convener, we all want forests and woodland to be managed sustainably, and the Scottish Government is, in, is not in any doubt that effective deer management is part of that, as, as many members have clearly argued. But there are technical and policy reasons why both myself and uh, Rosanna Cunningham, the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, cannot support this amendment. On policy, members will be aware that deer management has been comprehensively reviewed and discussed over the past year, uh, with the Scottish Natural Heritage Deer Review published in November last year uh, and the ECCLR Committee's report on deer management published in April this year. Both of these reports reached broadly similar conclusions on the state of deer management. Good progress made, but significant further effort required. My colleague Rosanna Cunningham set out the Scottish Government's response to these reports in uh, the answer to a PQ on 29th of June. Uh, she said, we intend to set up an independent expert group to examine and develop solutions to barriers to effective deer management in the uplands and a separate panel under the Deer Scotland Act 1996 to look at lowland deer management. We will ask SNH to report on progress on deer management in 2019. We will be looking to see effective deer management that protects the public interest. If the review does not find sufficient progress with these objectives, then we would have no alternative but to consider fundamental changes to the framework for deer management in Scotland. Uh, having set up the independent group and given notice that we will look at making fundamental changes if there is not sufficient progress by 2019, I believe it would not be sensible, convener, to cut across the work of, of this group, group, the group set up uh, following parliamentary scrutiny, uh, and nor to cut across the further efforts that uh, will be required. Deer management is not an issue that should be treated in a piecemeal fashion. We have given deer management sector as a whole, uh, including forest and woodland owners and managers, a clear indication both of what is required and the timescale, and we have been clear on the consequences if sufficient progress fails to be made. So that is the approach uh, which the Scottish Government has taken and which I understood had, had broad support. Um, CONFOR and Scottish Land and Estates agree with the Scottish Government position that the amendment should be resisted. They both favour cooperative approaches to tackling, the issue, to tackling the issue over legislation that has the effect of singling out forest owners and managers. Um, there are also some technical reasons why I can't support this amendment. We, we don't think it appropriate to support an amendment that compels ministers to make regulations using the affirmative Procedure. This is a very broad provision and it gives wide latitude regarding the content of the regulations, but at the same time appears to indicate that ministers should create new penalties for failure to comply with those as yet unidentified regulations. Um, we need to be very careful about the creation of new penalties as well as potentially criminal offences. It's vital that we are as specific as possible about the behaviour we are criminalising if that is the intention who the offence will apply to and what are the appropriate penalties. And we would expect also that Parliament has an opportunity to scrutinise these aspects, usually through primary legislation. I think I agree with the analysis that Mr Rumble set out originally, that you know, had the committee intended to, to cover this in the court as relevant in this bill, it should really have consulted on it at, prior to stage one and taken evidence from it. Although I understand the sincerity uh, and uh, commitment behind Mr Finney's views and Ms Beamish's views and really those views that have, have been expressed. Um, so for all the, these 
uh, reasons, and whilst understanding the intentions of the members involved, I, I, I would urge uh, that uh, these, these amendments are not pressed, and if they are, that they are not supported. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I call on John Finney to wind up and either press or, or withdraw your <coughs> amendment. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, convener, and I'm grateful for the members uh, for their contributions. On, on the question of evidence, yeah. of course, we did have evidence. We've heard from the convener of the other committee that we had evidence. We also, if people had chosen to, to read the, the submissions we had, we had reference to, to Dia. So, uh, Mr Rumble's talking about it being unhelpful in last minute. This is actually the first opportunity people do have to bring uh, amendments, and these amendments are brought in, in good faith. On the question of the SIs, of course, they will have to be judged on their individual merits. This, absolutely. My point was that, uh, and reiterated by the Cabinet Secretary, that this is really an important issue. Nobody doubts that. But we should, if this was our, your intent to bring this forward, it would have been really helpful to have been able to, to actually question witnesses in the stage one process, and then we could have interrogated everybody and come to a proper conclusion. Doing it this way, in my view, is not the, the best way to do it. Yeah, well, well, I note your comments. You know the volume of evidence we do get, and it's, it's a very small percentage which is actually scrutinised at the end of that table there. Um, the, the question of um, Peter Chapman talking about the bill is about trees. It's precisely because it's about trees that we need to consider what the negative impact on trees can be. And um, the, um, the, the comments about native woodland are welcome. This isn't piecemeal. One of the earlier amendments was to have an overarching approach. But um, what I would say is I note the members' comments. I note the Cabinet Secretary's willingness to continue to engage in this. If we could add this to, I think, two other items to the agenda, just to understand how the, the concerns that are held in good faith, notwithstanding all the good work that's ongoing, can be addressed, then I won't press. Thank you, uh, Mr Finney. So I, I, it's withdrawn. <laughs> Thank you. So, therefore, I'm, I'm going to... Sorry. <coughs> Of course. Sorry, my, my mistake. Does any un other member object uh, to the withdrawal of, of this amendment? Okay, fine. Therefore, we'll move on and I will call amendments 24, 25 and 26 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, all previously debated with Amendment 18. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move 24 to 26 on block. Can't do it. Moves on block. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 24 to 26? No. Okay. So the, the question is amendments 24 to 26 are agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. We're agreed. So, sorry, the question is that section 9 be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. Okay, I call amendments 27, 28, 29, 30 and 31, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move men, amendments 27 to 31 on block. I moved on block. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 27 to 31? No. Okay, so the question is that amendments 27 to 31 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call on amendment... Sorry, I miss, keep missing the best at the end. The question is that section 10 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call on amendments uh, 32, 33, 34 and 35, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments... 32 to 35 on block. Does any member of... Sorry. Moved on block. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Sorry. Does any member wish to object to a single question being put to amendments 32 to 35? No. no. So, the question is that amendments 32 to 35 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I've forgotten the section at the bottom again. The question is that section 11 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. We now move to the next grouping, which is Scottish Minister's duties to publish maps. I'd like to call Amendment 36 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, groups with Amendment 36A and 37. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 36 and speak to all the amendments in the group. 
Um, amendments 36 and 37 in my name are part of the suite of amendments to the land management part of the bill lodged in response to requests for clarity on the land that will be managed by Scottish ministers under section 9 and 13 duties. Section 12 was introduced places a duty on Scottish ministers to publish a description of forestry land that they manage. The purpose of the duty is to provide transparency on the land to be managed under section 9 duty to manage land for the purposes of sustainable forest management. In consequence of the amendments to sections 9 and 13, including the stipulation that the non-forested part of the National Forest Estate is to be managed under the section 13 duty, I have concluded that the transparency duty should apply to land managed under both section 9 and section 13 land management duties, not just the former. And Amendment 36 makes this extension, Convener. Further, as set out in the explanatory notes for the bill, the intention is that Section 12 duty is delivered via an online mapping tool. In the interest of clarity about what is meant by description in the Section 12 duty, Amendment 36 makes it clear that the duty is to publish a map. The map will provide the associated forest inventory data. Forest Enterprise Scotland currently publishes detailed annual snapshots of inventory data for Scotland's National Forest Estate as open data online. This detailed land use data for the whole of the National Forest Estate, covering both the forested and open areas, is therefore available online for download scrutiny and analysis by interested parties at any time and will continue to be made available. Amendment 37 changes the placement of the transparency duty within the bill so that it falls under Section 13 reflecting the extension delivered by Amendment 36. Uh, I do not support Amendment 36A in the name of Andy Whiteman. As I have said, the purpose of the Section 12 duty is to provide clarity about the land managed by Scottish ministers. It is right that there should be transparency about that, but Amendment 36A would fundamentally change the scope of Part 3, which is about management of land, not ownership of land. The amendment would duplicate the role of the Keeper of the Registers and cut across established arrangements to complete the Land Register of Scotland uh, and to provide information publicly on Scotland's forests and woodland. It would also convene a place an uncosted and, in all probability, a very, very substantial financial burden on Scottish ministers on which there has been no consultation whatsoever uh, and no estimation whatsoever, costings which would entirely duplicate work that has been carried out by registers of Scotland. I would draw committee members' attention to the views of two of the organisations whose members are working hard to complete the land register. Scottish Land and Estates say that amendment is unnecessary as there is already a process of land registration underway in Scotland that will fulfil the objective. CONFOR say that legislation and land ownership should apply to all types of land equally and should be dealt with under different legislation. They also say that the decision to plant trees should not be influenced by consideration of what information will have to be publicised, which would not be required if the land was left without trees. The Keeper is working to complete the land registered by 2024, with public land registered by 2019. Information on Scotland's forest and woodland cover will continue to be made available to the public. I can see no merit in cutting across these established arrangements, and I therefore urge members not to press or support Amendment 36A, and I move Amendment 36. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I call now on Andy Whiteman to move and speak to Amendment 36A and other amendments in this group. Andy. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. I move 36A. Uh, I've tabled this uh, amendment uh, with two purposes in mind. One, uh, to extend uh, the duty to publish information to other forest land. That's in the context of the long title uh, of the bill that entitles uh, make provision about Scottish Minister's functions in relationship to the management of forestry land and other land. And secondly, to improve information availability on the characteristics and the nature uh, and ownership of forestry uh, land uh, in Scotland. We have an ambitious programme to expand forestry, cover much of this will be done by the private sector, and yet there's little of any data to inform policy that would best achieve uh, those uh, goals. Uh, in comparison to other European countries which publish extensive data um, about non-state owned uh, forest land, data is very scarce in Scotland. In 2006-07, the United Nations Economic Commission on Europe, together with the Food and Agriculture Organisation of the UN, conducted an inquiry into private forest ownership 
uh, in Europe. It includes the demographics of owners and on gender, etc. The UK provided no data on the question uh, of this, uh, on the status of owners, their residency, their owners' objectives. The UK also offered no data. And the reliability of that data in 2006, according to the Forestry Commission, uh, that was supplied to the UN Economic Commission in Europe on 27 July 2006, were estimates which in turn were derived from a survey carried out UK-wide as long ago as 1977, that's 40 years ago, and couldn't be broken down by country. So officially we know nothing about ownership patterns, owners' motivations, and the characteristics of the private sector. Uh, convener, it's my contention that we need to know more about this to better inform uh, policy. Uh, my... Uh, policy goal here would be to, to, would be to have a proper annual return and survey so that we knew this information, but the most straightforward way to bring this amendment uh, is as an amendment to section 36. And I understand the Cabinet Secretary's comments about perhaps technically it should not be in this section, and if he was minded to consider uh, the purposes behind this amendment and put it in an appropriate place, I'd be happy to have that uh, consultation uh, with him. Uh, finally, this does not duplicate any work that the Registers of Scotland are doing. This is not about determining ownership. This is about the publication of information and data and analysis to better inform uh, policy. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Convener. <clears throat> uh, Andy Whiteman uh, properly uh, referred to the long title um, as talking of forestry land and other land. Um, the amendment from the um, Cabinet Secretary talks forested land as distinct from forestry land. Um, I'm not at all clear what other forest land in the context of the amendment actually means if it doesn't, if it's something beyond what in uh, Amendment 36 is forested land. So I'm very unclear uh, what that means. And uh, I'm, I'm also left a little bit unclear as to how one would identify um, some of the information that uh, Amendment 36A requires uh, without there being a right uh, to access forest land, uh, as at Section C, uh, to establish the facts that are required to be published. I'm not sure if there's an access provision for anyone to uh, achieve that. Um, I know and uh, respect absolutely uh, Andy Whiteman's very long-held uh, interest in establishing the ownership of land in Scotland, and I very much agree with him on that matter. However, there is the practical issue that while the land register is making progress, it's already emerging that it's going to be fundamentally pretty difficult to complete the transfer from the register of assassins to the land register on perhaps the timescales that are thought, uh, currently being thought about. And where private land's concerned, um, that will be particularly difficult because, of course, the costs associated with that uh, fall on private uh, landowners. So I'm a little bit unclear about that. Uh, at paragraph 5, which essentially uh, seeks to commit the government to a two-year cycle of publishing uh, maps, I think that is extremely challenging. I think that, if I recall correctly, and I can be corrected on this, um, that, that the Ordnance Survey works on a five-year cycle because it just isn't broadly thought that you can work in a two-year cycle uh, in the terms that the amendment appears to say. Uh, and I think I would echo what the Cabinet Secretary said. While uh, the objectives within the amendment are perfectly fair and reasonable, um, I would be reluctant to accept this without understanding the costs that are associated with it and, of course, uh, the corresponding benefits that we might expect to derive. Uh, John Finney, you'd like to say something there. Yeah, thank you, uh, Convener. I, I want to speak in support of my colleague uh, Andy Whiteman's um, amendment here. Now, if I noted the Cabinet Secretary correctly, he said it would fundamentally change the scope. People will be fully aware that the situation with uh, our land in Scotland is, is and, and my colleague Andy referred to the UN <coughs> looking at it, is, is simply embarrassing the situation. So, yeah, the word challenging was rused repeatedly. This is entirely meant to be challenging, and of course it's in channel, challenging. Um, and another issue, the, the question that's come up for not the first time today about the, the phraseology used, people know how amendments come to to be considered here. They are all competent. People can express a view in them. And, and uh, you know, so um, 
Surprise, surprise, Scottish land and estates don't support that. Well, in, its, in many respects, that's the very reason that I would be lending support to anything in the first instance. But there's a lot of merit in this, and I would encourage members to support it. Thank you, Mr Finney. Um, this was the second area that I was going to speak in, so I'm going to come in here and then ask the Cabinet Secretary and then Andy Whiteman to, to, to wind up and press his amendment. My, my comment on it was specifically in relation to 36A, 2A and B. First of all, I'd like to make it entirely clear that I support uh, the ownership of land in Scotland being clear and available and accessible to all people. Therefore, I welcome the work that the Register is doing, and I see that being a useful uh, document which will be accessed by all. I'm not sure it helps. We've heard evidence from the mapping, how good the mapping and the control system is of the Forestry Commission at the moment, and I've found it to work very well when I've gone into it. As far as the characteristics of forests on the land covered by the map, I have some issues with that because it is very difficult to def define the characteristics of forestry and then where do you go to the next level. At the moment we have some very useful maps developed by the Macaulay Institute which gives a land classification for all land across Scotland. It also gives some productive capacities for land and on top of that then you could factor in the different forests and you could then factor in the different yield costs and actually at the end of the day you'd end up with a map that would be very of very little use. I cannot see how that, that helps forestry. So for that reason I, I'm struggling to support it. It is not the reason that, that I want to cover up land ownership. I believe it should be open as I've said but, but I just think that this is not the map to do it. Does any other member want to make comment before I pass back to the Cabinet Secretary? Cabinet Secretary, I'd ask you to wind up, and then I'm going to bring in Mr White. Uh, I stand by my previous remarks. Thank you. Uh, Andy Whiteman, would you like to wind up and move your amendment, or press or withdraw your amendment 36A? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Uh, to make it clear, I'm not seeking to duplicate any work that anybody else is doing. I mean, the argument that the Registers of Scotland is accessible is, is, is wrong. It would cost you tens of thousands of pounds as an individual if you wish to access this information from the, from the Registers. Countries across Europe provide good statistics. I see Mr Stevenson shaking his head. It's £30 per land title uh, you have to pay in order to obtain information from the uh, Land Register. Countries across Europe publish good statistics on an annual basis about many aspects of land use, not just forestry, but we're talking about forestry here. Uh, those include very good data, for example, on the gender uh, of forest uh, owners. Uh, I think we need that in terms of equalities impact. We're developing policy around forestry expansion completely blind as to who uh, currently owns forestry land, the kind of people that we might wish to see um, own forestry land or more of it, for example, women, uh, communities, uh, farmers, families, uh, etc. So my amendment, whilst I accept there might be technical reasons for its uh, not being included uh, under this section, uh, is a very straightforward amendment designed to achieve the policy objective of providing better data and an app to enable uh, everyone with an interest in this matter, including policymakers, academics and the public, to better understand the nature and characteristics and patterns of forest ownership in Scotland and to place a duty uh, on ministers to publish that information in exactly the same way as they publish the information relating to the National Forest Estate. And I move and press the amendment in my name. Thank you. Um, therefore, the question is, Amendment 36A be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. no. We're not agreed, therefore we'll go to a division. Those in favour, please raise your hands. That's two. Those against? And those abstaining, one. So therefore the result of that, there are two votes in favour, eight against and one abstention. The motion is, uh, the amendment is not agreed. The Cabinet Secretary asks you to press or withdraw amendment 36. Uh, pressed. The question is amendment 36 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, the, the question is that section 12 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I therefore call Amendment 37 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 36. Cabinet Secretary, please Move. can you formally move it? Moved. The question is that Amendment 37 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
I therefore call Amendment 38 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 18. I remind members at this stage that if Amendment 38 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 39. <coughs> uh, Cabinet Secretary, will you formally move, please, Amendment 38? Moved. The question is that Amendment 38 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. We're not agreed, therefore there is a division. Can I ask those in favour of the amendment please to raise their hand? And those against the amendment. The amendment therefore is agreed because there are seven votes for it and four votes against it. Uh, sorry, it's that one, isn't it? The question is that that section 13 is agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that sections 14 15 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I'd like to call Amendment 6 in the name of Peter Chapman, already debated with Amendment 2. Peter Chapman, could you move, move or not move the amendment, please? I would like to move the amendment. Uh, the question is that Amendment 6 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Oh. Yeah. We're not agreed. There is a division. Uh, can I ask those in favour of the amendment please to raise their hands? And those against the amendment please to raise their hands. Okay, there, there are no abstentions. There are four votes for, seven votes against. Therefore, it is not carried. I call Amendment 40 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 2. Cabinet Secretary, could you formally move it, please? Moved. The, amend, uh, the question is that Amendment 40 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. That is, the question therefore now is that Section 16 be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. Therefore, I call Amendment 3 in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 2. Mike Rumbles, would you move or not move the amendment? Move. You move the motion. Therefore, the amendment, the question is, is Amendment 3 agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. That is agreed. I therefore call Amendment 41 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 2. I remind members that if Amendment 41 is agreed, I cannot call Amendment 42. Cabinet Secretary, will you formally move it, please? Moved. The question is that Amendment 41 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not. There is a division. Those in favour of the amendment, please raise their hands. Those against the amendment, please raise their hands. There are seven votes in favour of it, four against, votes against, therefore the amendment is agreed. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'd like to call Amendment 12 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 2. John Finney, could you move or not move it, please? Um, excuse me, convener. Um, yeah, um, moved. Okay. I would like to call Amendment 12A in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 2. Jamie Green, could you move or not move it, please? Moved. Okay. The question is that Amendment 12A be agreed. Are we all agreed? Oh. Yes. We're not agreed, therefore we go to a division. Could I ask those people in favour of Amendment 12A to raise their hands? And those against the amendment, please, to raise their hands. Anyone abstaining? There are four votes in favour of the amendment, six votes against, one abstention. Therefore, the amendment 12A is not agreed. John Finney, can I ask you to press or withdraw amendment 12? Yes. Thank you. The question is, that amendment 12 be agreed? Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. Uh, therefore, there is division. Those in favour of it, please raise their hands. Those against it, please raise their hands. And uh, any abstentions? Okay, uh, at this stage there's, there's five votes for, five votes against and one extension, which means that as convener I have to exercise my casting vote and my casting vote is to agree the amendment. 
I therefore call amendment... <coughs> sorry, have I got that right? The question is that section 17 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call amendment 43 in the name of Richard Lyle, already debated with amendment 23. Richard Lyle to move the amendment, please. Move. The question is that amendment 43 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. All right. Sorry. The question is that section 18 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I'm calling amendment 132 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with amendment 23. Jamie Green to move or not to move? To move. The question is, is that amendment 132 be agreed? Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There is a division. Therefore, I ask those all in favour of the amendment to raise their hands, please. Four. Those against to raise their hands, please. There are no abstentions. There are four votes for, seven votes against. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed. I call the amendment 44 in the name of Richard Lyle, already debated with amendment 23. Richard Lyle, could you move? Thank you. The question is, is that amendment 44 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Um, the question is that section 19 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I therefore call amendment 45 in the name of Richard Lyle, already debated with amendment 23. Richard Lyle to move. Move. On. Move. The question is that Amendment 43 be agreed. Sorry, 45 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 20 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 21 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. It, it has become clear at this stage that we are not going to get through all of the Stage 2 debate today. Uh, we will have to pick up next week. Um, and I would remind members that amendments to the remaining section of the bill can still be lodged. The deadline for doing so is 12 noon tomorrow, the 7th of December. Uh, the Parliament, uh, just to say, the Parliament has not yet determined when Stage 3 will take place. Uh, in fact, I don't need to say that just now. And I just need to say that that concludes today's business, and I'm sorry that we didn't get through it all. Thank you for your attendance.